Um, okay, so my name is John Fedota. I'm a program officer in the Division of Neuroscience and Behavior at NIDA. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the planning committee for, for this meeting. Um, those of us on the planning committee have the same blue background. So if you have questions or, or anything like that, um, you know, logistics, um, reach out to, to one of us either in the chat or, or over email or, or, or whatever works. Um, but I, I first wanted to thank all of you for your time and, and your input to, to date on, on this and for taking time to participate in both the discussions uh, today and next week. Um, the, the format of the meeting, I just want to lay that out um, very quickly. And I put the, the link to the agenda, um, which uh, is on the website that, that you all um, hopefully have, have been a, had a chance to look at. Um, the format for the meeting is today, day one, we're going to have a, a pair of, of focused discussions, 90 minute discussions, um, basically trying to address the question or trying to start addressing the question, what does recovery look like, right? Like what is, what are the realities of recovery from a lived experience perspective or, or from a clinical practice perspective to try and understand um, uh, the, the realities of, of, of recovery and, and what are the milestones or what are, what are the, the um, touchstones of progress through, through recovery. And then day two, um, which will be Monday the 20th, uh, the, the goal on that day is to translate the information from day one into uh, uh, clinical studies and operationalize the, the, the answer to what is recovery so that we can ask targeted questions that are, um, that are relevant to understanding recovery and also complete the loop to try and uh, improve the, um, the care and, and, and the services available and, and support people in recovery. Um, so because of, that, because of that format, that's why there's two days or three days in between the two meetings. So our goal is gonna be today, we're recording the meeting and taking notes to synthesize the, the answers to the discussion, the, the, the main points in the discussion. We'll provide those, those um, high level summary notes to everyone in advance of the discussion on Monday. Um, and, and we'll use that to focus the, the discussion on the second day when we, when we talk more about operationalizing. Um, so this is a discussion centered meeting, um, you know, the, the goal is not to have any slides on the screen. Um, and, you know, it, it will we'll work through any of the, the uh, bumpiness of that in with the large group, um, you know, by using the raise, raise hand function and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's why we have the, the moderators from, from NIDA to help do the sort of air traffic control for that. Um, but the goal is to cross pollinate across a spectrum of perspectives on recovery. So we've intentionally brought in uh, a unique gathering of, of perspectives all the way from, you know, uh, people with lived and living experience in recovery uh, through people doing clinical, preclinical models and, and um, the analysis of data associated with recovery. And, and, and the goal is really to make sure that everyone is, is participating in the discussion and, and that we can sort of make sure that the, the kind, the realities of, of recovery on the ground are, are being reflected in the kinds of studies and, and the kind of work that, that we're all doing. Um, to that point, um, we want you to ask questions and we want you to give input. There are panelists associated with each one of these discussions, subject matter experts on you know, the, the, the topic of each one of the discussions, but the goal here is for everyone to participate as, as much as, as you're comfortable in each one of the discussions. Um, and to do that, you know, the first thing is that, that we want to make it clear that everybody's on equal footing here. There, there are, are relevant experiences and relevant perspectives to provide um, at each level of, of recovery. And, and sort of to, to support that idea, um, one of the things we're going to ask is that um, in the discussions, we, we use first names, so not Dr. Fedota and, and, and all that sort of stuff. I, I, you know, that, that will help engender that. Um, and we also want to use uh, patient-centered and non-stigmatizing language. And, and I'll put the, the link to that if, if you're unfamiliar with those terms um, in the chat and, and, and we can go from, from there. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, there are a, a number of observers online. So this is a public meeting. Um, and so they have access to a QA, and a and, and I'm speaking, I guess, directly to them as well. At this point, you have access to the Q&A. Um, we will do our best to monitor that Q&A. Um, and is, if there are relevant uh, uh, comments or, or questions that come up, we will, we will uh, incorporate those in the discussion. Um, we'll take care of that. So, so the, the folks uh, on the panels, don't, don't worry about the, the Q&A. Um, but our priority here is the discussion in the room. We wanna provide, that, that's the unique thing about this, this workshop is, is providing, gathering people with all these perspectives. And, and we wanna make sure that, that there's uh, a 
a sharing of, of those ideas uh, across the, the individuals in the room. So that's the priority is to, to keep that discussion uh, going. Um, and if so, if you have a Q and A question that we don't answer, that's why it's not because we're we're ignoring the questions. Um, and and with that, in, if there are, unless there are any questions now, um, we can uh, we can move on, and, and I can hand off to, to Dr. Volkov, Nora, for uh, for opening remarks. Um, but but I wanted to to see if there are any questions that anyone has at this point about the the meeting or the format or or the goals here. Okay. Great, and like I said, um, we are feverishly taking notes behind the scenes um, today and we'll provide everybody with the high level summary of, of the discussion and the salient points that come up today in advance of the second day of the meeting. But, but again, please uh, you know, speak up, ask questions, uh, provide input. Um, you know, it, you're not only allowed to speak in the, in the session that you're a panelist for, um, we've invited everyone because we, we want all the, we want all the shared perspectives to, to, um, come together to sort of understand recovery at multiple levels and, and then operationalize, uh, that understanding. Um, but with that, um, Nora, if, if you're ready, I'm, I'm happy to hand off to you. Um, Nora's, uh, obviously the director of NIDA. And she's going to provide some opening remarks before we get into the discussions themselves. John, hello and good morning, everyone. I guess no, it's not morning. It's a good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, actually, and to have this uh, workshop that actually addresses an area that unfortunately has not been uh, researched sufficiently in any way. And I think that what we are aiming to do in the workshop is to try to figure out how to advance the science of recovery. And I think the first thing that we need to uh, understand is what that is that's the definition of recovery, because it is not straightforward. And depending on where you are, recovery may be very different from one person versus the other. So if we're discussing it in terms of how do we bring re neuroscience methods and preclinical methods into recovery, it is crucial and fundamental that we understand what is it that we on the actually described as recovery is crucial. And it is also crucial, not just even from the perspective of developing animal models, but I would sort of say from the perspective of asking the question, what is the prevalence of recovery on people with substance use disorder? So who of those suffering from substance use disorder can be said to be on recovery? And obviously that's going to be very dependent on the definition. So the definition is crucial. And I do hope that through all of your experience and perspectives, we, we come up with actually uh, something that we can work with as this is what we call recovery. I um, and, and, and that will then to not just allow us to see what is the prevalence, but I think that in, in bringing the, how can we advance science? What are the neurobiological processes that that actually associated with recovery in terms of what neurobiological processes improve the likelihood that I achieve recovery on the one hand, but are there neurobiological signatures that basically are, are associated with the recovery itself? And, and that is crucial. I mean, so, so, so at the essence, that's why I come and reiterate how important it's going to be to come up with a definition that then we can promote research and understand it within that context. Another aspect that I, I, I do sort of as we're discussing what animal model or what experiences is clearly that um, the way that you achieve recovery is going to vary significantly from person to person. There's not two ways around it. And, and some of those factors are going to be determined by the own individual but other factors are going to be determined by the context or the, the stage in their life in which they find themselves. Where recovery may look very different from someone that is middle-aged, that from a young person. So identifying that diversity as well as ultimately your culture to me. So certain cultures are much more embracing as a community than others which are isolated individual very much. So how do we define recovery in, in those environments and contexts? And finally, I want to put the question of, um, we've done, I mean, NIDA has typically done a, a significant amount of research is one of our priorities in terms of treatment. So how do we define recovery different from treatment as, or as part of the, the treatment cascade. I mean, so you start and then you want to eventually achieve recovery. 
So, and how do we define these processes vis-a-vis -vis also to cure? Can we cure addiction? Can When someone is in recovery, can we stay this person is cured? And what does it mean? And I think that um, helping to define and clarify those points would help the field in terms of scientific advances, because currently there has absolutely been work on research and uh, recovery capital, which is a very, very important concept, is based, yes, on recovery capital as a person, as a community, and my recovery networks and resources. So how do we translate that in ways that we can apply it into animal models in that in not are over oversimplified, but take into other consideration the extraordinary complexity of the links that are necessary for a person to achieve recovery. And I and I and I would feel more confident if I was making that statement, even if I had a better definition of uh, where we all agree of what is recovery. And, and you know it was interesting because I was in a meeting of people that are taking drugs, that they are not at this point interested on treatment. And that was a question that they asked me, what do you uh, define as recovery? And, and my response is, I says, well, right now, the way where we stand right now, very much recovery is driven by one's own experience. And so it can vary from person to person. But that definition in, in itself, that, that level of variability makes it extraordinarily difficult for us to actually study it. So agreeing on, on the terms of what we call the recovery and what we would want to expect and how to it, it's, it's necessary to then build up the structures to do it. So this is my message to all of you. Uh, please um, help us. Uh, at the end of this meeting, come up with a definition. And also, it will be very, very valuable if at, uh, at the end we have a better clarity vis-a-vis -vis of what may be some of the priorities and what are your suggestions on how NIDA can help you all achieve it. But other than that, I want to learn. I mean, I want to learn from all of you that have been thinking about this. Um, because this is an area that has been neglected and is long overdue time for us to try to understand it much better and to use science for that purpose. So, and I also want to emphasize how important and crucial in this endeavor for definition, for priority identification, it is to have the voices of people with lived and living experiences because they are the ones that are have the, the, the experience of what it means to have a problem with addiction, what it means for them to achieve recovery, what is valuable, what was helpful to them to arrive in that terms. So I want to thank, uh, that is a, is a way for me to thank them for their generosity and willingness to be part of this discourse and um, this meeting. So thanks very much. And I look forward for, uh, as I say, learning from the presentations of the rest of the meeting. John, I turn it back to you. Thanks, Nora. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, and this is a, a salient point um, given the timing of the meeting. Uh, so we encourage you to be on camera and all that sort of stuff. Um, but if you don't wanna eat on camera, definitely turn the camera off, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, it's not, we're not you know, um, Feel free to share if you want, but but um, you know, just in in the spirit of engendering conversation, as much as you're comfortable staying on the on camera during the the meeting would be great. Um, okay, so I, I think at this point, if um, Shelley and Noel and Jess, if we've got the a critical mass for the first session, we can probably get started a little bit early um, in the hopes of of helping everyone beat the traffic at, at the end of the meeting. Sounds good to us. All right. I'll hand it off to you guys. All right. Thank you so much. We're um, so excited to uh, um, help facilitate uh, the first panel for the workshop today um, uh, so we can showcase input um, and viewpoints and more information about recovery from individuals with lived experience. Um, my name is Jessica Holsey. I'm the founder of the Addiction Policy Forum. Uh, my lived experience is as an impacted family member. I lost my parents to opioid use disorder and I've 
uh, been doing this this work in the field um, in their honor in many ways. Um, and APF really works to make sure that all voices are at the table, including uh, those uh, in treatment and recovery, family members, um, and also making sure that we have access to latest science and knowledge and all the amazing work that all of you all, the scientists, do in the field. So, Noel, want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Noel Vest. I am an assistant professor at the Boston University School of Public Health, and um, I'm kind of have uh, double duty today as kind of a co-facilitator uh, and then also chiming in as a, as a panelist. And I just want to say how incredible it is to have, you know, to be at a NIDA event and have, you know, recovery be in the title. I think that, um, you know, when I got started in this area, uh, it would, you know, be unheard of to, you know, 10 years ago or so to, to have to have that. And so I'm really, really excited uh, for that. Um, I also have a, a K award to, uh, to study collegiate recovery programs with, with NIDA. That's who I am. That's great. Thanks, Noel. Uh, Noel and I are going to kind of just alternate posing some questions to our panelists, but we thought it would be um, really helpful to first have each of our panelists take a, about a minute or so for a quick introduction um, uh, for all of you. Uh, and we've asked everyone to share your name, where you're from, length of time in recovery, um, if you're comfortable sharing information about your substance use disorder, and even your current profession or work. Um, so can I, uh, start, uh, with Kayla? Hi everybody. I'm Kayla Zawislak. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, I am outside of Chicago, Illinois. I, uh, in a few weeks, I'll have 10 years in recovery. Um, uh, my substance use disorder. Thank you. Um, I'm a poly substance use disorder person, <laughs> um, stimulant use, uh, alcohol use. I really, anything I could get is what I used. Um, so really, um, that really came into play with my recovery. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker, as well as a certified alcohol and drug counselor. And I work at the addiction policy forum. I'm really grateful to be here and I will pass the next person. Uh, David. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is David Frank. Uh, I'm here in Queens, New York. Uh, I am not a person in recovery. Uh, however, uh, I am a person who uses heroin, uh, and I've been on methadone for about 20 years now. I also wrote my doctoral dissertation on how recovery plays out in methadone maintenance treatment. Uh, in terms of my work, I am a medical sociologist, uh, and my current uh, position is as an associate research scientist at New York University, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you, David. Uh, Luke? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Luke Tamsha. Um, I am the founder and executive director of the Perfectly Flawed Foundation. Uh, we're located about 100 miles southwest of Chicago uh, in Illinois. Um, someone that used heroin for chaotically for over 14 years. I'm an engineer by trade. Um, and I, uh, you know, I don't identify in recovery. I identify as Luke, right? Uh, uh, we do a lot of overdose prevention and we have uh, people seeking uh, recovery and, and a better life. But uh, um, I no longer use heroin. However, uh, I use cannabis to manage um, the reasons I used heroin. And uh, I am uh, non-abstinent, um, but I am someone that is pursuing uh, a better life and pursuing happiness and uh, away from uh, chaotic use of heroin. Thank you. Hey, she Yes, my name is Keishi Bernard, and I am the Director of Outreach for Jolt Harm Reduction. So I provide direct care to people who are using drugs, people who are unsheltered, and people engaged in sex work. And of course, there's a huge intersection there. And I identify as recovery-ish. I was raised by injection heroin users, poly substance users, and um, then became an injection heroin user myself, along with multiple other substances. And um, I've achieved function in my life now and a degree of happiness and what I consider to be success. Thank you so much, Keishi. I appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, Helen or Skip? 
Yes, hello. Please call me Skip. Okay. Hello, everybody. Oh, grateful to be here. My name is Helen Skip Skipper. I am a member of the Council on Criminal Justice and also the founding executive director of the New York City Justice Peer Initiative. I'm also a grad student pursuing a degree in criminology and pushing on towards my PhD. I have 17 years of long-term recovery and I am impacted by every be traumatizing and oppressive system, most notably the criminal justice system. Happy to be here. And I'll pass it on. Thank you so much. Um, Shana? Hi, I'm Shana Sellers. Um, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I've been in recovery for um, about almost three and a half years. My drug of choice was pain pills. Um, I work as a um, home health aide at the moment, but, um, and I also have my um, certification in peer support specialist and I'm happy to meet you guys. Thanks for being here, Shana. And Deltron? Yes, good, good afternoon. My name is Deltron. I'm a certified peer recovery supporter in Lorain, Ohio for Let's Get Real uh, Community Recovery Organization. Um, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, coming up in September, I'll have seven years in and uh, most of my adult life, I grew up selling cocaine and I acquired a, a substance use disorder of cocaine after losing my leg uh, from trauma from an automobile accident. And um, I'm grateful for the, the progress I've made. And, and it's just an honor and a privilege to be here with this, with this team today. And Noel, uh, can we circle back to you as well as a facilitator and, and a panel participant? Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, my name is Noel Vest. I'm originally from Vancouver, Washington, but uh, now I live in Boston. Um, I was addicted to methamphetamine for uh, about 10 years and now um, I've been in recovery for almost uh, 22. Uh, I too, like Helen, was involved with the, the criminal justice system. Uh, and uh, after I got out of prison, I, I worked as a drug and alcohol counselor for about four or five years before uh, taking the leap and, and going to, to grad school. And I'll, I'll send it back to you, Jeff. A little bit more just sharing on the lived experience side. Um, uh, in, instead of treatment, my parents were offered incarceration for their heroin use disorders, which is when I entered the foster care system and was made a uh, ward of the state of California for a number of years. Uh, and I've been in one way or another working in policy and advocacy since um, since I was in college. So uh, I'm so excited that and grateful that NIDA has pulled um, this workshop together and you're leading the workshop with individuals with a lived and living experience um, and such diverse uh, uh, sort of perspectives, uh, I think is, is so important. So I'm, I'm really excited to, um, about our panel. Um, so I'm gonna kick off with the first question and then let Noel uh, take it with the, the second one. But uh, we wanted to start off with our panel members first sharing um, what supports or services did you or do you rely on in your recovery, right? So what types of um, uh, treatment or services, lifestyle changes, uh, uh, what, what components did you or do you use uh, um, uh, to sort of help in your, in your recovery? Um, because we know all pathways are different. So giving some perspective to our uh, uh, folks at NIDA and our research partners we thought would be helpful. Kayla or Noel, did you want to go first? And then we'll sort of pass it off to other participants. Sure, I'm happy to start off. Um, so for me, I think in the beginning, I, I mean, a lot of the similarities are the same from the beginning to what I do now. Um, a lot of the things I rely on is going to support group meetings regularly, um, counseling. I did a lot of, and still do a lot of like trauma therapy. I went to treatment for trauma. 
Um, exercise is a huge thing for me. Um, I need to like physically be running, lifting weights, doing things like that. Cause that really helps me feel mentally, physically, uh, better, uh, addressing my mental health symptoms. So seeing a psychiatrist, being on medications, um, when needed, um, counseling, working on different skills with that. Um, another thing that's really big for me is service work. So being actively involved, whether it is in my support group, in my community, um, giving back is something that's really important to me in my recovery. Um, and then another thing is just like accountability, like having accountability, whether it's with a sponsor, with my therapist, with my group of friends, my family, uh, accountability has, has been a huge thing for me. Uh, thank you, Kayla. Skip, you have your hand up? Yes, the question was about recovery, I just wanted to mention that recovery is about the hope and the promise that there is a better life for you. And recovery is also for those, I want to say, who are at that, that standpoint in time when they're ready for it. For many times, I was mandated into recovery, which means I was forced to submit to a program, and it never took for me. I achieved recovery when I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Some of us need those life altering, changing events to have us look at life differently and wonder about the possibilities. And I experienced one and don't get me wrong. It was not the multiple arrests and years of incarceration because I have done that so much. I'm used to it. I, I could do that laying down with my eyes closed, but it was a life changing event that really had me look at who I was, where I was headed, and realize where I wanted to head to and start to embrace the aspects and the promise of recovery. So you getting to that stage of change uh, piece was really critical in that, that recovery piece. Thank you, Skip, for sharing. Any um, of our panelists wanna weigh in? Shana, would you mind sh sharing a, a little bit about um, treatment pieces or um, items that you've relied on in your recovery? Um, yeah, my biggest um, uh, thing with recovery was um, I had to, um, it was the acceptance of knowing that it was okay to ask for help. My biggest thing was not wanting to be judged. So when I got past that, um, I was like, okay, you know, I can ask for help without anyone, without feeling like I was less than or I was the black sheep in my family. And it took me a while to even come and tell my family, like, hey, I'm in recovery. Because they had so many negative things to say about the ones in recovery. So the biggest thing was being able to accept it in myself and realizing that I did not need their approval to be in recovery or to say, hey, I need help. Because their help was different than what I needed. And having those meetings of knowing that others were in the same predicament as me and knowing that I had other people to lean on and to talk to about it, that was a really big help in me continue to be in recovery. Thank you, Shana. Keishi? Yes, for me, the first time I experienced any long-term sustained recovery was through a diversion court option. And um, they recommended I go, went on methadone and methadone did help me achieve recovery for the first time along with my mother. They, I think we all know, or maybe we don't, but that's the gold standard for OUD. And that was super helpful for me. And then I actually was tapered off methadone. And for those who don't know, and I want it duly noted for everybody who's listening to hear that withdrawal from methadone in my personal lived experience opinion is way worse than even withdrawal from heroin. And I think that needs to be talked about more when we talk about recovery and the dangers of people being put off of it. But I um, got pregnant as a teenager and then the next time I achieved any sort of recovery was because, of course, DCFS was threatening to take my child. And so 
the tactics that are used for coercive recovery, they don't stick. None of that stuck with me either. It was a decision that I had to come to on my own eventually. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, David, and then I'll go to Michael. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm also on, on methadone maintenance. I've been on 20 years. Uh, as I mentioned, even though I don't identify as being in recovery, uh, I certainly, uh, methadone has allowed me to go from super chaotic, you know, like like the movies kind of heroin uh, use to, uh, you know, a much more stable, much happier life. And, and I think it uh, bears noting that my experience on methadone doesn't really match like the sort of party line. And, and this gets to a little bit of my critique, and I don't want to be like the fuddy-duddy of, of recovery, because uh, I, I accept any people's, uh, you know, however they identify, and I don't think drug users have been given a lot of discursive space to frame their own experience. That said, uh, methadone allowed me to go from a chaotic lifestyle to a non-chaotic lifestyle by giving me a way to consistently access opioids outside of the criminalized war on drug system. And that's what allowed me to go from this like super chaotic life uh, to, you know, the professor at NYU. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it bears noting that methadone is not just about this sort of, you know, abstinence or, or it, it, people use it in all different kinds of ways, including harm reduction. Thank you, David. Michael? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Michael Askew. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of Recovery at SAMHSA under the leadership of the Office of Assistant Secretary, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. Uh, I'm a person with lived and living experience since May 28, 1989, uh, where I uh, was uh, incarcerated for my sixth time uh, in prison. Uh, and I found recovery in prison. I never went to a formal treatment setting. Uh, as they say, I didn't have time to waste getting high, so I didn't feel that treatment was going to be a great option for me. Uh, but thank you for uh, it being introduced to the 12-step fellowship. And uh, after my three and a half years of incarceration, that sixth time, I came out with a full, uh, uh, you know, spirit of believing that, you know, uh, I could succeed. And so I uh, continued to give away, like, uh, you know, it was shared uh, through the young lady, I forgot her name, who was sharing how, you know, giving back was so instrumental in me uh, being able to uh, change my health and wellness. Uh, but I also, uh, in 1998, uh, was introduced to the faith-based community. And, uh, you know, that was where I began to uh, get support for my spiritual uh, growth and awareness. And, uh, you know, my religious beliefs is uh, really has helped me support uh, my journey of recovery uh, as well. Uh, and in my role in, in my, uh, my career, uh, you know, working with a nonprofit for 22 years uh, as a recovery oriented system of care model. Uh, you know, I've seen the benefit of how uh, my role helped many people and helped myself uh, in sustaining and maintaining recovery throughout the years. And now that uh, I'm the deputy director of the Office of Recovery, it's really unique that, uh, you know, I've been able to give this opportunity to really help move the, uh, the national agenda for making this nation a recovery ready nation. So I'm really grateful to be here and be part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And Deltrin, have your hand up. Yes, uh, my name is Deltrin. Um, my recovery journey uh, started in the basement of my church. And, you know, we were going, we had Bible study uh, sessions and and uh, recovery wasn't really in the forefront of my mind at the time. I, I was awaiting charges uh, for drug trafficking and, and recovery wasn't available for me uh, in my community at that time. Only thing that I was offered was prison. So, you know, Bible study came along and we started a recovery group because we found out that a lot of people that was attending the uh, Bible study group had substance use uh, disorders and, and we formed a group that way. And then ultimately I, I went to prison and uh, I started a, a, 
uh, recovery group called Just for Today and uh, Marion Correctional Institution. And uh, that's where, where it started. But, you know, for people uh, from my culture and, and my background and my surroundings, you know, re, uh, going to treatment wasn't something that was uh, readily available or, you know, anybody that I knew had taken a part of. So, you know, starting these self-help groups uh, began my recovery journey. And what keeps me uh, on this path is now that I'm back in the communities uh, doing my work as a certified peer recovery supporter, uh, sharing my experiences, uh, giving resources and information to the different methods and, and ways to, to recovery and, and uh, hosting two groups a month, uh, one for people with uh, amp amputations. And then uh, we have a peer support group called Count Time uh, that we host. And those are some of the things that keeps me on the right track and, and keeps my recovery in the forefront of my mind. Thank you, Dalton. Luke? Um, uh, yes. Um, you know, when I first, uh, 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 when I was going through my uh, chaotic use of hair, when I was, at the time, I was a tech director at a, at a school district. And, uh, you know, I would check myself, you know, I didn't want to be chaotically addicted to heroin. I didn't want to be dependent on uh, the substance. Like, it was tough for me to get through the withdrawals. Um, so I would check myself in and out of uh, rehabs over spring breaks and, and Christmas breaks. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was, I didn't relate with the traditional model of, of recovery. It was either chaotic use or abstinence, right? A and, you know, go away for 30 days and then your life's going to be uh, all different um, in, a, in an environment that's nothing like the world you're going back to. So I think with me, readapting to a new life was my biggest challenge. Um, you know, and, I, and when I would go to these treatments, and I think everybody's story is different. Um, and, and we all have different paths, uh, you know, th that led to our addiction. And there's paths that uh, take us out of that. And, and I just started with small wins and positive change and really just having that mindset in, in my head. Um, uh, but, you know, I would go to 12-step uh, uh, meetings and we host 12-step meetings here at our at Perfectly Flawed, but, um, and then support groups are different, you know, in different areas, different regions. And, and my first experience was being chastised and uh, being shamed where I didn't relate with the disease concept of, of addiction. Um, I, I'm not gonna argue brain science, but I didn't like being identified as my disorder or my disease or, or, uh, uh, or, or whatever, because I, I wasn't abstinence and I, I knew I wasn't going to be abstinence. I knew I would uh, moderate certain substances. And, uh, but, if, but, if, but when I challenged that is that, that you know, the disease was, the, it was just like a, a monkey on my shoulder that just felt so disempowering and I needed to be empowered uh, because I knew I could make change. Um, you know, I, I believe in uh, uh, God, I'm spiritual, but I, I didn't, I, I felt my relationship with God was was separate than why I was choosing drugs. So I think um, it, it, to me, it really became about pursuing happiness and, and I didn't have happiness in my career. I was in technology, I have ADD and you know, I'm fixing things and there, things are always changing. It was stressful. You know, I, I found my comfort in, in, in substances. And uh, so when I got out of, um, uh, uh, when I stopped using, um, my, my, my goal was to not go back into technology and find something that, that gave me value, that gave me uh, purpose where I could use my experiences to help others. And, and uh, it didn't, you know, I could have made a lot more money going back into technology, but I, I chose not to. I chose to um, cash out my retirement. I chose to bartend at my family's restaurant and just try to get by until I could, you know, I, it was just on that pursuit of that happiness. So I think too often we, we, we put the emphasis on the drugs and the alcohol, um, you know, stop drinking coffee, you know, how many people can do that, right? Like, you know, I, I, I think a behavior is a behavior, whether it's shopping, drinking, sex, alcohol, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee. Um, but I think when people become chaotically addicted, there's some underlying uh, unhappiness. So I think for me, it was really about um, 
pursuing joy and uh and it didn't happen overnight and, and so um i also feel that uh you know like i said i identify as luke i, I don't identify luke who's in recovery or luke because if someone who with the general public especially in a small rural area well well luke smokes pot oh he's gonna he's gonna uh you know uh things are gonna fall off the uh, off the cart because he's not in recovery well that's really not the case um uh and uh I, I think there's so much stigma out there so the people that are are struggling the most we're we're demanding perfection out of them and uh and if they don't achieve that they're judged and they're stigmatized and um so uh yeah that's that's just the the the, the, the direction i i come from but like i said at perfectly flawed we deal with people that are in active use through our syringe exchange and overdose prevention you know there's there's prevention of overdose and there's prevention of drug use right and people that might want to seek recovery but there's just that middle ground of um you know there's just a whole spectrum of of, of substance use yeah really really important stuff uh thank thanks luke uh for for that perspective and, and, and bringing us that message um i i want to to go back to something that, that Dr. Volkov said in the beginning, you know, she really kind of put this emphasis on that there's these differences between where someone's at, maybe in the continuum of care, of, you know, prevention, treatment, recovery phase of the continuum of care, but then also differences based on developmental stages that a, a person is, is on. And that's definitely been the way it has been for me uh, as well. You know, when I was early, early in my recovery, you know, they say 90 meetings in 90 days, like <clears throat> mutual help was like, I mean, I, it was like 900 meetings in 900 days uh, for me, but that was early kind of uh, in my recovery. I would say I go to mutual help meetings very sparingly uh, the, these days. Uh, I really liked what Kayla said. I use exercise a lot. It was really, really important at a certain time in my recovery. I definitely don't get the exercise that uh, I probably should. Uh, or, or that I did at one time. Uh, and then another kind of a stage of my life is that, you know, I, I started a collegiate recovery program when I was a resident fellow uh, at the at the substance-free housing unit at Stanford. And so that was kind of my primary recovery uh, space for, for quite some time. And, and it was just different being around, obviously, college students in recovery uh, than it is uh, with, with other kinds of, of, of people in, in recovery. And so, again, I just want to reiterate that, you know, for 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 people like me, uh, it may shift over time as far as you know what what you might use as a support service. But for other people, I think they find one thing and they kind of stick with it, uh, and, and they they stick with it for a long time. And so, really, really great uh, perspectives here, though. So we want to move on to the next question, uh, and the next question is: How long did it take for you to feel? stable uh in your in your recovery you know how long was it before you kind of woke up in the morning and, and felt uh that you were uh stable in in your recovery and, and we realize that this answer is going to be different for for many people uh on this call um I'll, I'll take a first stab at this really briefly um uh, you know for context you know this was uh, 10 years uh after 10 years of continuous methamphetamine use uh, i was 30 years old uh, when when i uh entered into recovery um i detoxed in, I, I only ever detoxed in jail um and you know my first seven years uh, of recovery uh, were in in prison uh, i had never gone I, and i still have never been to to treatment um so for me uh, it took uh, about two and a half to three years before what, what I kind of call the cobwebs in my brain uh, disappeared. And what I mean by that is I, I finally woke up one morning and I didn't feel like every decision that I was making that day was going to be funneled first and foremost through my relationship uh, with drugs and alcohol. I could think about other things uh, first, uh, when I when I woke up, and so you know, I think that our our brains are definitely an incredible organ, and and it's really apt to being able to heal itself. Uh, but it really does. It takes time for those neurotransmitters and those pathways to kind of form uh, new new connections, and so uh, and, and new pathways. And you know, like I say, for me and my the context of of drug use that that I was in, um, it took right around two and a half to to three years. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'm going to call on um, 
uh, Deltrin first, and then we'll we'll go to to Helen. Okay, thank you. Well, for me, I think it was probably around nine months to a year, you know. But you know, the substance for me wasn't the biggest issue. You know, it was it was how I felt about myself and the things that I've been through. I have lost all the loss that I've suffered, uh, losing a limb, uh, losing relationships. Those were some of the things that I had to recover from. And, and not only that, the lifestyle, the lifestyle of, of selling drugs as a young black man coming up in your community and you think everybody's around you uh, is probably in poverty. So you, you're find, trying to find a way to, to find financial stability but not looking at the consequences of my actions, uh, not only for my incarceration, but the people, the lives that I was helping uh, destroy. So having to, to sit back and think about all of the things, the, the destructive lifestyle that I was living and the tre tremendous loss I suffered of losing a part of me and my freedom. So, you know, the, the substance, you know, probably nine months to a year, but, you know, even in my recovery today, sometimes success doesn't feel successful. And what I mean by that is recovery takes a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of stuff that you're going to gain, but there's a lot of things you're going to have to give up too, and, and relationships. And, I, and I'm still dealing with with that people that are close to me that I still see struggling. And, you know, and our relationships, you would think they would be better because I'm not uh, living a criminal lifestyle anymore or, or using cocaine anymore. But the people around me that I love and care about, they're still in active uh, use. And they're looking at me like, oh, you think you're better than me. And sometimes it, it feels like you know, they want to see my struggles or they want to see me fall. So I think it's a, a lot more to recovery than just uh, getting rid of the substance. Yeah, I can relate to that so much. In my life, it's, you know, my biggest critics have been the people uh, kind of closest uh, to me. And that's that's really a, a hard thing with, with entering in recovery. Um, all right, Skip, so good to see you here, Skip. Yes, no, yes, thank you for this. Um, I have to give some context first. So I suffered from a co-occurring disorder um, and I also had mental illness. Um, between my addiction and the mental illness, I consistently went back and forth to jail for a period of 25 years. I was able, never able to fully enter into recovery because A, I wasn't ready, B, I never had the treatment or supports to get into it and C, all of this on me as far as navigating the world with criminal justice impacts, with, with mental illness, and with uh, uh, suffering from a, a drug addiction it was very, very, very hard. Even though I struggled and worked as hard as I could, I did not feel that I was fully in. Believe me, I was abstinent from from drugs, but I didn't feel like I was fully into recovery um, until I started feeling some sense of self-worth. When I started working, and I don't mean the starts and fits of jobs I had that I lost because I was criminal justice impacted, or jobs that I had and I lost because my, my mental illness and you rubbed me the wrong way and I let you have it <laughs> because of my lived experience. But I mean, fully into a job that uplifted my self-worth and made me feel like I was worthy and I was worth something. And that was when I started becoming a, and being a peer. And that happened about a year after my last release from incarceration in 2007. It's like once I, I and I fell into peer support very innocently, but once I fell into it and I leaned into it and I used peer support to help support and mentor others while also using it to bolster myself up, my sense of responsibility, my sense of self-worth. Um, I found then that I was squarely into 
recovery, but only after that. I mean, I was still doing NAs and stuff like that, but you still don't feel it. You know, we have imposter syndrome. We 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 don't feel it. We could be living in it for five, six years and still have imposter syndrome, still feel like the next one is right around the corner or right in front of us. And we're just struggling so hard not to reach out and grab it. Oh, I'm finished. I'm trying to be short. <laughs> no, I'm trying no, to be no. short in my responses. Yeah, I'm, I'm over here trying to, to find the, the mute button. Uh, so, uh, Michael. Hey, yeah, thanks, Deltrin and uh, Skip. Good to see you guys. And, uh, you know, my 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 first realization, uh, I believe, was, uh, you know, I, I had my last three and a half years of prison, I uh, had to go to a halfway house for 18 months. And, uh, you know, I was shaky, but I got a sponsor and they would come pick me up to go to meetings. Um, but I was still in an environment right downtown where I, you know, I ran the streets uh, in South Noah, Connecticut. And uh, at the halfway house, I got a position as a shipping clerk at this pharmaceutical. And uh, uh, what, what, I, what, what happened was, um, I got inspired by being the best clerk, shipping clerk that, you know, I could be, you know, so I, I really made it a, 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 an emphasis on doing a great job, uh, trying to find better ways to, you know, deal with the inventory and the shipping process. Uh, and, you know, I was still going to 12 step meetings every night. Uh, you know, I, I started to go to church and uh, back, this was back in 96, 97, 98. And so um, in one meeting, you know, someone like, I didn't think about using it today. And all of a sudden, you know, the mindset was, wow, you know, I, was, has it been lifted? But, you know, because, because now I'm starting to, you know, really have purpose and I'm really giving away, I'm, you know, chairing, you know, subcommittees for, you know, the 12 step fellowship. I'm going into prisons and speaking and setting up groups here and there and, and actually, the halfway house they invited me to come back as the the peer specialist to to do the Wednesday night group at the house. And uh, you know, all of a sudden, I'm feeling like 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 Skip said, I'm I'm feeling worthy. I'm feeling like like I have purpose today. And you know, although like Delta said, you know, there was people that was looking at me like, you know, as I walked down the street, they're like, Mike, wow, you look good, man. What you doing? I'm like, you know, I, I ain't doing what I used to do. And they're like, wow, you could tell, I tell you, you're doing something different, man. I'm like, well, I, I found a way out. And, you know, if you want me to show you, I can give you some insight. But, you know, one of the things I did feel comfortable was um, probably in my, like, you know, my fifth year, uh, you know, back in 96, my fifth, sixth year, I felt complete and whole. And I say that because at that point, you know, I could like, you know, I could walk into uh, a place and not feel comfortable with someone drinking. Uh, you know, you know, I, you know, I didn't go into crack houses, but I certainly would, would 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 encourage somebody not to. But certainly, I felt comfortable with who I was and what I was. And uh, so, I say about maybe my fifth, sixth year, uh, I found relief. Thank you, Luke. Uh, yeah, similar to Michael, um, you know, I think I, I would wasted in my a lot of my potential for 14 years. I would put a lot of money into to, to dope, and and uh, you know, it. it I still, I, I finally gotten to the point where I feel um, stable. You know, I, I had mounds of debt. I'm finally out of debt. I, I finally, um, for the first time in my entire life, you know, it's taken me like seven years. I got a good credit score. Um, I have a couch that isn't a hand-me-down. I'm not 40 years old on my my mom's phone account, <laughs> you know, things like that. Like, and, and it just didn't happen overnight. And and yes, I could have went right back into technology. I could have taken care of all that stuff, but that's not what I wanted because that's what brought me my unhappiness. So to me, it's always been that 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 path. And you know, and you know, I still have. I mean, it's it's sad to say, but I still have syringes up in my attic because when I would use, we had no places for syringe disposal, and I didn't like to throw them in the trash or anything like that. So I just throw them up in the attic, 
and uh, I, I got most of them out of there. But it's just that, you know when I'm when I when I'm ready, I'll I'll I'll, I'll take care of that. But so I I think it's 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 not uh, a, I think it's just an entire journey, and and I, I do feel happy now, and I do feel uh, much more stable. And like I said, uh, I, I can finally afford a car, and I'm not on my mom's uh, cell phone plan. So uh, it just takes a while. Okay, I'm getting so wrapped up in people's answers, I, I forget that I'm, I'm moderating. Uh, uh, Kessie? Yes, for me to feel comfortable in my recovery, it took, and I had 14 years with no reuse at all. But for me to feel really, really comfortable to where it wasn't a thought at least every day, I would say was right around two years. One thing that's interesting for me in recovery, though, is by the time I hit that 10 year mark, I thought I was 100 percent in the clear, like it wasn't going to be a factor at all ever, like I was untriggerable. And um, I am a middle aged woman. And when we talk about ages and stages of life, this is when a lot of transition can occur. Divorce happens, death of parents, children get older, you're if you have parents, you're taking care of them and you're raising children. So life events, right? And um, I am not untriggerable after 14 years. And that was a discovery I made. And so it's still there. But I think having purpose, like everybody else has said, you know, I do direct care to people in the most chaotic use. I'm street outreach. So I go to trap houses and and bandos and homeless encampments and stuff like that so and that was never never been an issue for me it kind of reminds me how how fast that slope can go down but um I did find out you know that it's still there but having the purpose keeps me from falling back into chaotic views so I think recovery capital whether like Luke said, being able to pay your bills and having some sort of functionality or self-defined success is so important in the recovery process. Awesome. Uh, Margaret, do you want to uh, add uh, one more thing real quick? And then I'll, I'll, uh, I want to add one more thing and then we'll, we'll move on to the next. next sure. Question. Sure. I just wanted to mention that, you know, in, in my, in my uh, work, um, I begin to, change the perception of people that were in aftercare and, you know, uh, programs where they were, uh, you know, getting support for their recovery. And I asked them to take a look at their relapse prevention group setting and put in a mindset that it's not about relapsing, but it's about recovery management or enhancement. And so, they would walk away with a sense of being able to believe that 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 uh, that 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 discussion they had at their group was more about how to enhance your recovery instead of thinking about how to avoid relapse. So the mindset that they changed the perception have them more become more whole and uh, encouraging. So just wanted to share that. Yeah, really, really important. Um, I, I want to piggyback on something what Keshi said. Um, uh, so I, I mentioned that it was about three years before kind of the cobwebs has, had disappeared. I too had, you know, some life events happened uh, when I was about 12 years into my recovery. I went through uh, a breakup um, and, uh, you know, the first one that I had had in, in recovery. And I think that the neuroscience people uh, on this call that kind of understand that disease model and then the withdrawal negative affect phase of that circle that, that George Kubin and, and Nora have, have talked about for a long time um, will really relate to this because, you know, I, I too thought I was 100% ready for anything that was going to happen in recovery, right? 12 years, I thought I had it all kind of figured out. Um, and I was white knuckling it for, for six months after that breakup, every single day I woke up wanting to use. And so that agitation, that emotional turmoil, that whatever you want to call it, that negative affect state, uh, is so real. Uh, and it doesn't matter how long you're in recovery. So the loss of a loved one, the loss of a, a relationship, the loss of community, uh, is so, um, 
it, it, it can just be really, really uh, vital in, in a person that, that, that is in recovery. And so, um, uh, yeah, that was a, a very scary time uh, in, in my recovery. And I honestly, there were many, many days that I didn't think that I was, uh, was going to make it. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on to the next question, Jeff. Thanks, Mo. So um, I think Luke already kind of kicked us off with some thoughts about the next question. We really wanted to chat about uh, what is success in recovery for you? How do you measure your own uh, success? Uh, Luke mentioned uh, a, credit, a good credit score and uh, his own cell phone plan and uh, not being on a, someone's uh, couch and having a house. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, um, uh, sort of how do you define success? Is it abstinence? Is it um, some of these uh, life moments? Is it job-related, purpose-related about your family? Um, how, however you, you, you measure or sort of think of success, we'd love to, to hear from you. I think we were going to, well, if anyone want to raise their hand, they can jump in. But uh, Shayna, uh, Kayla, um, any, anyone want to want to start us off? Um, I would say with me, with how I um, measured my success was um, actually being able to have money. I mean, that was the biggest thing. I was always broke when I was um, um, on pills. Like I, I didn't never had any money for anything. I was returning stuff, just trying to make sure that I had enough money to get through that day or that week or whatever. And even being able to um, being able to deal with my emotions and my feelings when it came to um, me being upset. I didn't feel like I needed a pill to get me through that. I was able to be like, okay, you know, I can deal with this without having to take a drug to um, make myself feel better. And that was the biggest thing was learning to deal with my emotions without having, um, without being on pills. Because I, while I was on them, nothing really bothered me. And but being able to actually feel something like that was a lot for me. So um, I found that 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 made me feel very successful in my recovery. Was you're like, okay, I can deal with this. I can get through this. It's it's not the end of the world, you know. And that I will get to see another day. And it's not going to break me by having these emotions. Oh, thank you. That's amazing, Shana. Having those reserves and skills to manage day-to-day -day or bigger stressors and recovery, that can so much work goes into developing those healthy coping skills. So thank you for sharing that. So Skip, Kayla, then Mike, Michael, then uh, Deltrin. We got a lineup on this question. So <laughs> I, I just want to say it's everything that that you mentioned, and then it's more. Um, is it about materialistic things? Yes, of course. I spent 25 years going in and out the system, addicted to cocaine, crack, and suffering from a mental illness, and I never had money for anything. Money to feed myself, money to dress myself, money to do anything. So being able to amass some materialistic things, being able to have some money in your pocket, I developed my own saying um, because I was so into crack. It was everything fits in a stem. And it's true. Everything you own fits in a stem. You fit your materialistic pres uh, uh, materials, uh, your money. All of that fits in a stem. And um, when I was able to start having money in my pocket and look at a materialistic thing and say, hey, I want that and be able to go get that. That's when I knew I was there. And even today, my partner fights with me because I have a, a weird thought about money. It doesn't matter that much to me because I burnt through it and, and threw away a lot of it. So today, I don't deny myself anything. I'm not looking at the cost of something because I remember when I had to do it back then when I was getting high. I'm not going to do that now. So we fight because I'm like, you make money, you spend money. You want this, go get it. You deserve it. Oh, she's more like, oh, I got to save. I got to this, I got to that. Man, I don't know nothing about saving. I know that I have money for a rainy day, but I also know that today I am alive. 
I am in recovery. And if I want X, Y, Z, I'm going to go get X, Y, Z because I can't. Thank you. Thanks, Kev. Kayla? Yeah, I piggyback on what everyone has said. I think also, um, I know for me, I had other like process addictions before I entered into recovery. And then in recovery, a lot of times they've come up, whether it's food, shopping, sex, gambling, whatever it is. Um, I have a lot of outside issues, I guess you could say. And so if I'm not self-harm, not engaging in those behaviors, that really helps me measure my success in recovery because it isn't just the substance, it's all that other stuff which I think doesn't get talked about enough that crop up again in my recovery. Um, and I know lots of people deal with it, but it's just not talked about. Um, I think another thing is how I react. So I had a son in recovery, how I react to my son, just like Shana was talking about those emotions. Um, another thing is like accomplishments. Um, I have a huge fear of failure. So in my addiction, in my whole life, I start something and I don't finish it. Cause like, I don't want to fail or I'm afraid of success. And so actually starting something and sticking to it and finishing it, whether it was uh, graduating from school, running a marathon, doing all these things, like I have a tendency to start it and then never finish it. Cause I, I think there's that, like, like a lot of people have talked about self-worth or, you know, just like the fear of what's going to happen. Um, and then one other way I gauge my success and recovery is like asking for help. Because I know for myself, I hate asking for help. Um, and I know that I need to ask for help, whether it's what whatever it is for help. And so if I'm able to be honest about where I'm at and what kind of help I need, um, that helps me see where I'm at in my recovery. Thank you, Kayla. Michael? Yes, I just add to everyone's uh, comments that, you know, the one major success was that I was able to stop using. Uh, for 17 years, uh, I didn't know how to stop using. That was why this vicious cycle of prison evolved in my life. But uh, you know, after I stopped using, the next success was that I could, I started to accomplish some things. I, I was able to finish the halfway house. Uh, I was able to get a job. Uh, I was able to get a car. Matter of fact, I got a car with uh, a registered car with license and a, a, a insured car at that. <laughs> uh, but I also started to believe in myself like I shared. And then, you know, there's a lot of factors. You know, my family started coming around, giving me keys through the house and just, you know, uh, my inspiration was, um, you know, I, I, I came back uh, to the halfway house to do these groups for them. And uh, they started, they paid me. And, and, and then I started to go into the prisons. And I started, I got an award uh, in 93 uh, from the regional halfway house, uh, you know, initiative. Uh, and I think that was really measuring the success that I had accomplished, not believing that I would go back to prison, which I didn't. But also that, you know, I could make a difference in the quality of life that I was wanting to live. And I started to doing the things that I always said I wanted to do, but never was able to. And I think that's where now today, where I have a full life of doing so many things that I didn't think possible. And so, you know, I'm just grateful, uh, like us, like others that have shared, uh, you know, it's hard to measure success in recovery, uh, but one of the things I do believe in as far as measuring is the purpose that life has given me and how much I you know, bring myself to the table to support other people. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Michael. Adultrin? Yes, thank you, Jess. Um, recovery has given me perspective. Um, as I get older, those shiny things that I always aspire to want and, you know, all the material things, it really doesn't mean as much. As, as you get older, you, you're thinking about your your, your health and, and your family, all the things that are should have been more important to me at the time. But losing a 28-year-old niece uh, from a fentanyl overdose, uh, losing... Uh, 
the mother of my youngest son uh, from an overdose, uh, multiple clients that I've worked with over time as a certified peer recovery supporter um, has changed my perspective. Uh, and, and it keeps me grounded in my recovery because that is not the legacy that I want to uh, leave. So recovery has given me new vision, new goals. Uh, it's given me accountability. Uh, I'm showing up present in the moment. Uh, I'm not trying to scheme on where or how I'm going to make, you know, some large amount of money because what I found out is easier to make a buck than it is to make a difference. And uh, every day I wake up, I'm trying to make a difference. And uh, uh, my sobriety has given me an opportunity to do that. So with yeah. that, I'll pass. Yeah, no, I, I, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, and you know, for, for me, I would say that I, I measure success in, in the smiles that I get to see on my family's face, especially my little nieces and, and nephews, those smiles, uh, they mean the world to me. Uh, in a way that I, I don't think other people can can uh, appreciate. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to the next question. For this question, I, I definitely want to, um, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll be coming to you first, uh, David, but I, I, because I think that you're, you're, you, you have a really unique journey here. Uh, you know, we, we met a while ago and I've always just been, it's just really kind of fun to, to follow your journey. And so, uh, thinking about your time in like your early journey um kind of with uh the the systems that you kind of had to 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 to, to uh overcome uh maybe that first year what were some of the biggest barriers and challenges uh that you faced in that that first year uh in your journey Oh God, I'm not sure if my answer is going to measure up to the to the prelude uh, that you gave the question. Um, since my difficulties with drug use were not individually based, they were they were structural. The drug that I was dependent on was illegal and highly criminalized. Uh, so once I found a way to legalize my drug use by going to a methadone clinic. I was, you know, I've depended on opioids. Uh, once I found a way to get those opioids in a consistent, legal, safe manner, boom, it was done deal. Uh, I remember walking home from the methadone clinic on my first day uh, being like, my God, I, I'm not going to get dope sick today. And I was like, and I'm not going to have to go scheme and lie and hook up. And I was, and then the next, uh, I was like, they're going to give me more opioids tomorrow. And, and it was just smooth sailing from then. I remember, uh, yeah, you know, and, and this is not to discount the difficulties of the, the, of the regulation of methadone. I happen to be lucky. I mean, I'm a white male. So there's that. I live in Chicago. Uh, so there's that, uh, and I had a methadone clinic that was literally uh, two blocks down from my house. If I had lived in, you know, somewhere like so many people do, without access to that kind of thing, where you know, if I had to drive an hour, also my clinic, my clinic, just by sheer luck, was harm reduction oriented. Uh, I didn't even, I mean, I barely knew the word at the time. Maybe I didn't know the word at the time, but they actually, you know, would come to me and say, you know, you're you're doing good. You want some extra take homes. As probably many of us know, that's not the common way that this plays out. Uh, and had I been in a, a, a more uh, rigid, punitive system, I think I would have had those problems. But because uh, of my particular situation, uh, where I lived and all that stuff, uh, you know, once I found access to opioids, my problems were really not getting off drugs. It was getting access to them in a way that's safe uh, and regulated. And once I got that, I was, you know, it was a done deal. I was off to the races. Uh, no, I disagree. That was a great answer. Uh, oh, so, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Kayla. I think some of the most challenging things for me in the, like the first year um, were definitely sleep because um, a lot of medications that are out there for sleep are addictive. Um, or if you have a substance use disorder, they will not prescribe you. Um, and so like trying to figure out how to 
fix my sleep hygiene, how to sleep. I would always wake up in the middle of the night constantly. So just like sleep was really challenging for me. Another thing was, so they have like medications for opiate use disorder, alcohol use disorder, but stimulant use disorder, there's really no medications that are out there. And so really struggling with like I was using crack and cocaine regularly and then trying to deal with those cravings, uh, depression, all sorts of things out there. That was something that was really challenging. Um, and then just like in recovery, you have to change everything. Like for me, I had to change everything. I had to change friends, situations that I was in, dealing with social situations. Um, that was like my social anxiety, feeling awkward. What do I do with my hands? What do I say to people? Like dealing with all those things are really challenging. And then, like I said, process addictions, those things reared their ugly, ugly heads. Um, and then also gaining weight. You know, I was using cocaine and crack. I was, had lost a lot of weight because of the substances that I was using and then getting into recovery. I'm eating, I'm eating ice cream every night because of the sugar from the alcohol that I was using. And so like dealing with my body changing after stopping using substances and then gaining weight, it was extremely challenging to like navigate that, especially with like prior eating disorders. So it was, um, dealing with those things. And then the last thing I'll say is stigma, just a lot of stigma, um, about, I was 25 when I entered recovery this last time. Um, and so like being 25 and not being able to do substances anymore, um, there's just like, like, oh no, you just did it too, too hard. Or, you know, there's just like a, a lack of understanding, um, that's out there. And, um, and so it was really hard to have to like brush up against that. Um, I also worked in the restaurant industry, which drugs and alcohol is like huge in that. And so it was just, uh, really challenging to be like, no, I can't do this. Um, and, um, people not understanding. Yeah. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to share how uh, the most insights uh, that I had with barriers was, uh, you know, coming out of prison with a, a lengthy criminal record and trying to obtain uh, meaningful employment uh, as a Black person and certainly uh, as a person formerly incarcerated. Uh, and, you know, that challenge within itself, um, you know, I... I was I was fortunate that I ended up uh, starting to look for work through a uh, temp agency that kind of like push you in there in the back door, and uh, that was where I became that shipping clerk. And you know, I, I I know also that when you know coming coming out of that system where uh, you know you're criminal, you looked you know you looked to be a criminal. Uh, you know, th there's times when um, there's policies still affect individuals that uh, will not be eligible for certain programming and, uh, you know, certain um, different community uh, services. And, uh, you know, I came out of prison in 93 and there wasn't a lot being offered for people coming out of prison as it is now. So you have to kind of find your way. But I, I really want to just say um, it was really uh, important for me to find my own way through building the resilience of knowing how not to be part of the things that would put me back in prison. So when I walked down the street, um, I didn't get caught up in the, the mess I didn't get, I didn't, I, I just like someone said, disassociated myself with people that was using. I, you know, found myself really comfortable uh, finding new friends and new ways to live. And, and finally, the one thing that really helped me the most was that, um, like I shared, I started becoming part of the faith based community and I started praying. And, uh, you know, there was times when uh, I would stop what I was doing because I get this. You know, you get this uh, craving or a trigger, and uh, I would stop what I was doing, go somewhere quiet, meditate, pray, uh, whether it was a bathroom stall or wherever I was go, and I'd find some hope walking away feeling that I wasn't alone because that, that's, that was where I just knew that there was a power greater than me that could help 
grant me that opportunity to have another reprieve for that moment. Uh, and, and so that's what happened for me. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark. Jeff. Um, so uh, to share just a little bit of my mom's experience on the challenges in, um, in the beginning of sort of treatment and recovery, um, and I've also some similar themes in, in working with individuals um, uh, so here at our, our organization. Uh, a lot of it was how complicated it is. And sometimes I think when you we talk to sort of researchers or other folks in the field, when it feels very simple, you just do this one thing and you know it, it, you're going to be cured or fixed quickly and it'll be over. When in reality, my mom was trying to manage coming out of prison, trying to make it to the methadone clinic, a lot of time it takes even for that one take home dose. So you're like lining up every morning, but she also had to see her parole officer, check in with a um, social worker with child protective services to try to see if she could have visitation with her kids again. She also um, had HCV, hepatitis C, as well as diabetes. So she had different physicians to try to manage other health conditions that were connected to her, S her SUD. It was recommended that she see a, a therapist for trauma and experiencing sexual assault during her active addiction. Um, and like, who, who has the time? That, that That's like, you know, nine different types of um, interventions and different types of clinicians for one person to try to navigate. Mind you, no credit, um, no money, um, didn't have a car for transportation, criminal records, no one would hire her. It was hard for her to even rent an apartment or um, have access. So all the barriers you could think of, plus sort of these clinical or, or social needs that, that she needed interventions that were all in different places and no one helped to coordinate or streamline. It was her basically trying to build a multimodal, multidisciplinary, holistic treatment plan for herself with not one person helping to coordinate that. And it was very overwhelming. So I think sometimes, um, and, and she passed away at only 50 years old. Uh, I wish she was, she could be on this panel with all of you, but it was, it was hard for her. And that stigma piece, I think, was maybe the overarching one of not feeling like uh, she belonged, a lot of blamey and judgy people around her including in our family um, and filling a lot of that stigma from healthcare providers, which made her sort of retract from healthcare in general. And she had multiple um, uh, sort of conditions that, that needed a clinician to help her navigate through. So um, it was um, complicated and overwhelming and sort of a full-time job to manage what three or four chronic health conditions that needed care plans. Um, uh, that she she just really struggled. So I, I don't know if it resonates with other folks, but I, I think how many balls that we can be juggling in the air to self-manage a complicated condition, I don't think it's talked about enough. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll go to Skip and then we'll we'll uh, go on to the next question, Jeff. I just, um, in, in listening to this conversation, I just want to, want, want to present and point out something. The experiences that women have with addiction issues, criminal justice issues, and everything else, I don't think enough attention has been slated to that. We come with a whole lot of baggage. Personally, I lost custody of my two youngest children through my addiction, through my criminal justice travels. Um, but you know when I knew that I was firmly in recovery? You get recovery, you start amassing some materialistic things like a laptop. Then you start doing stuff with the laptop. I, I built a Facebook account. And my two youngest sons that I lost complete custody of who were adopted out found me through that Facebook account. And that is the beauty and the promise of recovery that you can do all, you can be all. I started to be able to have some things. That laptop gave me a connection to my two youngest who I lost through the system. And now I'm, I'm mothering. But it just brings to light that the, the experiences of women, we, we need further research and further highlights on this on this issue, this is one of my research focuses, which is the difference of, of the experiences of women 
and these systems and everything we have to go through. So I just wanted to just throw that out. Thanks, Kev. Um, hopping into the next question, Noel, can I jump in? Yep. Um, so, uh, Helen, I'm glad that you uh, flagged uh, issues that we might see in, in specific needs among women um, in recovery. Um, and we also wanted to um, raise that we're seeing troubling increases in overdose fatalities among Black and Indigenous populations, um, and at the same time, lower rates of treatment access. So um, can any of our pan panelists speak to what do you think the challenges and barriers are for our Black and indig Indigenous individuals in recovery and treatment um, to make sure that we're, we're raising that issue for our, um, during our workshop today too. Deltrin, um, can I turn to you? Sure. Um, you know, my substance use of uh, cocaine, uh, like I said, you know, early on in, 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 in my substance use, um, treatment wasn't readily available. And I mentioned, you know, I was offered prison instead of treatment, but I think um, in the black community, it's the stigma that goes, you know, with treatment and, you know, nobody wants to be labeled, you know, but, you know, the truth of the matter, there are substance use issues there and uh, they're either uh, no insurance or underinsured and, and don't have the access to it. And, uh, I, I represent clients in recovery court. I work in four different drug courts in Lorain County. And, um, you know, the numbers are, are telling, you know, the, you know, the, the success rate of, you know, the black participants in recovery court is not the same as, as the rest. You know, it, there's a, a, a low number of, of uh, completion, excuse me, when it comes to the, to the court program. So we, we're trying to find different ways to, to navigate through that, but I think it's underinsured and, and, and uh, no insurance is a big issue. Thank you, Dalton. And that uh, punitive rather than treatment options that seem to be thrown at you instead. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Skip, you, you have your hand up? Yeah, I left it up because it seems like everything we're talking about is something I have something to say on. Okay. <laughs> and I don't want to monopolize, but I also want to no, point no. out that we have a dearth of a behavioral health workforce. More intentionally and specifically, we have a dearth of BIPOC communities contributing to the behavioral health workforce. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I know that when I was in treatment, I, I literally needed to have a clinician who looked like me, who came from my same culture, who walked the same walk that I walked. And a lot of times we get that in substance abuse. We have um, former addicts uh, turn into counselors, but they are severely hamstrung by the policy implications and the powers to be over them who are not from the community. And there's only but so much they can do. Um, we need to do a, a really heavy workforce development development push. We need not only peers, those with lived experiences, we also need clinicians. Why can't I find a clinician who looks like me, talks like me, came from the same community I came from, and has the same worldview as mine? Because I just can't do it with someone that does not know who I am, where I come from, and how I was raised. For me, that's, that's not beneficial, and it's not me being racist. Is just saying, how can I talk to you about how my mother wanted to keep everything in house and I couldn't talk to anybody but the pastor and what she wanted to do was just take me to church and sit me in church all day Sunday and think that that would just cure me of everything when I really needed to see a clinician, but there was no clinicians available. You know, and this is something that happens in BIPOC communities. Thank you so I'm much. I'm finished. That's good. So representation and what the clinician and healthcare providers are available, how important that is. 
Do we have any, any other participants that wanted to weigh in on some of the challenges and barriers for um, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities? I mean, I, I, as a sociologist, I would point out, and this is not a surprise to anyone, particularly Black people or other minoritized populations, you know, just structurally and institutionally, they're getting screwed over at every link in the chain, uh, and particularly in terms of criminal justice. I mean, the amount of policing in the Black community, uh, you know, pales in compare. Or, I mean, it's, it's way more than in other 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 communities. So, you know, all of these uh, structural determinants that just screw up people's lives and make it more difficult for them to have recovery capital and actual capital, uh, you know, I think are, are, are a big giant uh, part of the story. Thank you, David, for sharing that. Um, Noel, uh, can I pass it back to you for a couple questions about um, medications for opioid use disorder, MAT? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So th this this question is, is primarily, but, you know, anyone can comment here, but I would say it's primarily for the, the people uh, on the call that have utilized uh, medications, any kind of medications in your addicted treatment. Uh, and, you know, I just, I think more than anything, can you share the the benefits, the challenges in, in accessing? Uh, how long did you utilize the medication? Are you still utilizing the medication? What are some of the, um, you know, the, the, the problems with, with access and wraparound care and, and, and things like that? Uh, and so we'll we'll go ahead and uh, start off with with Shana, but anyone else that wants to chime on, please do so. Um, so my um, I've been on Suboxone for about um, three years now. Um, with that, I've had to, like my cousin actually helped me get into the program. And it's helped me a lot because that was the scariest part of being getting into recovery was um, feeling like I had to go through withdrawal um, and not knowing or not knowing what programs that they had available because I did go to my, my primary doctor and act, you know, I would let them know that I was on um pills I was addicted and I wanted to get help but their way of help was like well get as many pills as you can and then just try to um, tamp, uh, taper yourself off um, that's not helpful <laughs> I didn't feel like that was going to do anything for me it just made it more scary because I felt like I didn't have any help at all so I got to the point where instead of me buying pills I was buying um, suboxone strips from my cousin because she was in the program just before she you know was like well you can get it on your own you know I was like okay I just buy them from her and that way I can start but then you know if she needed hers for her recovery and I you know I was relying on hers also so I was still felt like I was stuck but once she um, let me know about it and I signed up, I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to have to go through withdrawal? Like, you know, I had other programs that told me that I would have to for a week. And that's a long time for someone who's been on pills for over 10 years to say that you a week you're going to have to try to go without. Because um, I had tried it before cold turkey and it, it it was not a good feeling at all. And me having a young daughter at the time, like she's still young, she's 10, but at the time she was probably like um, three, four. Um, it was scary to say, okay, I'm going to be sick for this amount of time. I had to take care of her and I couldn't take care of her knowing that I'm sick and I'm throwing up and I'm sweating and you know, I, I had I didn't have the stretch to do anything and I was a single mom. So getting being able to get on Suboxone helped me a lot where I'm able to have a life. I'm able to take care of her. I'm able to um, do things, go to her different events. And, you know, I'm able to be a mother to her without, you know, having to have a pill to get through the day. 
and currently I am still on um, Suboxone. I, I do the program. I um, I enjoy my recovery. It's the happiest I've been in a long time. Thanks, Shana. Uh, David, did you want to? Yes, uh, I actually probably have too much to say on this topic. I could talk about it all day and I don't want it to be just a jumbled mess. Uh, but as I mentioned, I've been on uh, methadone for about 20 years. And although my experience has been great, fantastic, uh, largely well, to a large extent due to my own privileges uh, and just luck of the draw, uh, but I, I, so many of the people I've seen, uh, in my clinics and in my research have not had that kind of experience. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that the programs, particularly methadone maintenance, much less so with Suboxone, uh, are not really structured to meet the full range of patients' treatment goals or treatment needs. Uh, they're really focused on, you know, abstinence as the primary only outcome that matters. And it's usually in a binary kind of sense. So you get people that are like, you know, I've, I went down from using heroin six times a day in and out of jail to only using occasionally on the weekends. And the clinic considers me a failure, makes me go in every day. And eventually I have to leave and go back to the far more dangerous uh, outside source. I also know a lot of people who for that same reason, uh, as well as other things, what Shana was talking about, uh, the, the particular difficulties that women and mothers have to face. One of my dear friends in Florida knew she should be on methadone, wanted to be on methadone, uh, but because she had kids and because this is Florida uh, and the stigmas attached to methadone and the regulations attached to methadone, she had to get on uh, Suboxone. She was literally worried that they would take away her kids. So she got on Suboxone uh, it was not doing the trick. It's a partial agonist, as many of us know, compared to the full agonist of methadone. And she ended up uh, using in a chaotic way and, and, and she, she overdosed. And it's tragic because she knew she should have been on methadone. Uh, and so you, the, the, the system, and it is changing. You know, there, there's, there's been uh, the final CFR rule. There's been uh, the, the Mota bill. And there's just been a, a bit of a change in conversation but it's not nearly enough and it's still a system that is not designed to meet the full range, particularly those looking for harm reduction or reduced use or less chaotic use uh, as opposed to uh, complete abstinence from all drugs. And that really needs to change because it would have an immediate effect on overdose rates. I'll stop. I don't wanna be on my soapbox too long. Yeah. And just to piggyback on what David said, um, within a lot of the work that I've done with individuals who um, take MOUD, um, there's so much stigma. Um, and one thing is like, you know, I, I know of someone who went to a certain treatment center and was taken off of his MOUD because it wasn't allowed at the treatment center. Um, even though this gentleman had been on it for a number of years, he, like he was just dealing with some depression. And he ended up dying because of that. And uh, I know in Illinois, there's a there's a lot of um, halfway houses and recovery housings that don't allow medication for opiate disorder, which is another huge challenge that folks are um, struggling with because it's the gold standard of treatment. Yet you can't go to a recovery home or uh, you know a halfway house while on it. And so then it's like, okay, I don't have a supportive living environment at home. I have this medication that's helping me but I can't address anything else because I have nowhere to go. Um, so I think that is like a huge challenge. And I personally was on medication for alcohol use disorder. I was on antabuse and I also did naltrexone when I was on it, they didn't have Vivitrol. Um, and so like my challenge was taking it daily. Like you have to take it daily and religiously, but if you don't want to take it, you don't take it. And so I think having an injection is super helpful because it's once a month, but that was like a huge challenge for me with adherence, um, having to take it daily. Yeah, thanks, Kayla. Uh, Jess, did you wanna uh, kind of take us home with the, the, the final question before it open it up to uh, audience questions? Yeah, uh, we wanted to make sure we left the last like 15 minutes uh, for you all to ask questions of our, our panelists. But uh, before we get there, um, uh, one sort of quick round robin question so everyone can weigh in. Um, really, uh, like what does recovery mean to you? Like how do you personally define recovery? 
we heard at the um, uh, when we sort of uh, the start of our workshop, there being such an, an interest in what the definition is, but it's also so personal to to each person. So we'd love to know what does it mean to you, and if you have a specific definition, and uh, and then we'll we'll pause and go to Q and A. Uh, Noel, did you actually want to start us off with this one? And I can yeah, you. sure. Um, you know, I think that this is a, I think this is a really hard question for me to answer quite honestly, because I have, I feel like I have three roles that I've kind of assumed over my life. So I'm going to answer in all three ways, right? So as a researcher, um, you know, I know that this is a lifelong disease state marked by kind of those three phases, phases the binge intoxication phase, the uh, preoccupation and anticipation phase, and then the with, withdrawal or negative affect uh, phase. Uh, so, so that's kind of one definition. As a clinician, I understand that it's like, um, you know, the, 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 what we kind of defined it as in, in, in treatment was uh, this kind of striving towards either decreased use or, or uh, uh, sobriety uh, and, and, a, and a reduction of, of symptoms as kind of a, a definition of recovery. But I think most importantly for me as a person in, re in long-term recovery, like it, it's not just a you know, it's not any of these things. It's it's my identity. It's part of who I am. It is not something that I study. It's not something that I watch the news about. It's not something that I can put on the shelf and go home to my kids and, and, and have that. It is part of who I am at my core. And I think that sense of identity is what makes people so adamant uh, sometimes uh, when, 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 they're ch when, they're, when their own recovery uh, is, is challenged. And so I think that's something that we really need to think about and kind of overcome. Thanks, Noel. Michael? Oh, I think you're on mute, Michael. I am, I am, yes, thank you. I'm gonna put in the chat the definition of recovery from SAMHSA. Uh, but, you know, I think what I like to say is, you know, my recovery was really, you know, a journey to wellness. It was, it was really having, like it was shared, the ability to be appreciative of who I am and what I became uh, and what I've always hoped to be. Uh, you know, I can address problems. I you know, I have skills now, uh, you know, I work on completely being honest, you know, I have a spiritual nature now that I can, you know, love and, and, and appreciate, you know, um, I feel healthy, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, but what it means to me is that I've been given a second chance of life. You know, I, I, I never thought possible that this would happen for me. Um, Many years that I challenged myself to want to get better, but I didn't know how to do better. And um, I get touched because I just, um, I know that if it had not been for God on my side, I wouldn't be here. So, so I'm just hopeful that, you know, my life continually um, allows me to dream more and be more. Um, and I finally found the true me that I, like I shared, I always wanted to be in without pain and purpose, you know, and um, you know that I, I'm stronger, I'm wiser, um, I'm more inspired to believe, and uh, I have a great, great life that I never thought possible. So that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing that. For, um... We're grateful you're here with us and you're inspiring others with your recovery story too. Kayla? So I think the way I, like what recovery means to me in the beginning is so different than it is today. Like in the beginning, I gauged it by abstinence and today it's completely different. I mean, yes, I'm still remaining abstinent and that's part of it, but it's really like, am I living better than I was yesterday? Like, am I improving myself mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, all of the aspects of myself? Am I like striving to be better? And that's part of recovery. And it's, you know, living with integrity, living with honesty, um, being able to look at myself in the mirror, my self-esteem increasing, um, working to give back and being of service. And that's like really what recovery means to me. And I think it's really hard to have one definition of it or 
be able to gauge what it is or who has it because it's such an individualized thing. And my recovery looks different. I mean, it looked different 10 years ago than it does today. Um, so I think it's a really hard question, but it's such an important question that people need to ask each individual because all of us have different answers. And that's what I think is beautiful about recovery. It's so individualized um, that we really need to look at it individually. Thank you, Kayla. Luke? <clears throat> Yeah, um, you know, we had a conversation with among some of us advocates in Illinois about this and, you know, uh, CRA always defined it as any positive change. And, you know, we just, we took that definition and expanded, you know, any positive change that is self-determined, unique to each individual and, and unimposed and not enforced. And, uh, you know, walking through our doors and, and valuing yourself enough to ask for a clean syringe is is, is recovery in, in my book. It, it uh, feeling safe to uh, take care of yourself and not do harm to yourself or, or others is positive change. So I, I think it can, you know, can start from anywhere. Thank you, Luke. Doctor? Yes, thanks, Jess. Um, recovery is, uh, and change is hard in the beginning. It's messy in the middle, but it's gorgeous in the end. Um, Recovery has given me the willingness to be a self-discoverer, to know who I am and and to stand on that, you know, and to be proud of uh, the growth and the journey that I've been on. Uh, I believe the people who have lost the most have the most to give. And, uh, you know, all of my life I've been, I feel like I've been a decent person and trying to help people, you know, I had my own selfish motives for for having that identity as a drug dealer. But uh, today I don't sell dope, I'm selling hope. And uh, recovery, me, recovery has given me the ability to do just that. Um, you know, and lastly, I just wanna say that I am a product of my past, but I'm not a prisoner of it. And today, you know, I choose to to live my life uh, for wellness and for the goodness and uh, and uh, and the growth of another person. Thank you, I'll pass. Thank you, Dalton, so much. Skip? Wow. All of that is so much vital. Um, let me just put it in my words. Recovery is about the hope and the promise that you can, you will succeed in whatever it is you want to do. It's about developing that resilience. I am an unapologetic peer, which means I am not apologizing for my lived experiences. They are what brought me into this room. Instead, I have navigated my lived experiences into professional lived expertise. And I use myself, which is my personal my professional, my academic life, and pushing forward this notion. Recovery is about the fact that you can. Regardless of what people say to you, I was a part of the never woulda, coulda uh, club. Every time I went to jail, they tried to put me up under the jail. Forget about the treatment. It was lock her up until, as my mama would say, from down south to the hounds come home. And no, the hounds never come home. You know what I'm saying? But once I started to believe in myself and believe in what recovery could bring to me, I started embracing recovery. But I think we all need to realize that recovery is also very individualistic because it's not about when I want you to recover or when your mom wants you to recover or your kids. It's about when you are ready to recover. And when you are ready to recover, guess what? You're in recovery. Now work that out and around and develop your own ideas of what recovery means. But for me, it's just about the hope and the promise that I can. And I don't like when someone tells me I can't because my recovery <laughs> makes me look at you, stand up tall, put that unapologetic swagger, you know, and I don't even have my hat on because I would have tipped my hat and, and do it just because you told me I couldn't, just because. But for me, that is what recovery means. Thank you. Thank you, Skip. Keishi? Yes, for me, recovery is being based out of Illinois. And of course, 
following the CRA model that Luke brought up and big, any positive change, it is truly self-defined for me. It's having a level of functionality and success is defined by me and being a peer worker. It's what my participants define. And I think Luke's at everything. It's the moment, you know, you have enough self-worth to choose to use a sterile syringe or even walk through the doors here or reach out to me and be like, what, what are some better health choices I can make? But I also want to circle back because this was left off the table um, about medication assisted recovery. As far as methadone clinics, which are the gold standard transportation in rural areas is a huge, huge barrier in a it's something me and my mother both experienced and it led to us using heroin and then having almost fatal overdoses. And then with women in recovery, DCFS still can consider medication assisted recovery drug use and um, retain custody of your children. So I just didn't want that left off the table, but yes, any positive change is defined by yourself or whoever you work with. I fight hard for the folks that I serve to be able to define that on their own terms. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I think there's a lot of themes that have come out that any positive change, constant work for that health and wellness, living a self-directed life. Um, my, my mom uh, would describe it as uh, being in the driver's seat again, right? So feeling like you're driving your own car instead of it sort of being driven by your substance use disorder. So um, uh, thank you so much for everyone chiming in on, on how you define recovery. Uh, there's similarities and themes, but also parts that are so unique to each of you. We're really grateful for you, to you for sharing. Um, I wanna pause now and uh, ask Nora and our uh, friends and colleagues at NIDA if you all have questions for our panelists. Yes, I mean, I have questions and I think it's sort of, uh, it's been a very refreshing perspective because it's sort of like, a, I was thinking the response that I gave to the, to the group of people that were using drugs and were asking me is not very different from what I'm hearing here, that it is very much defined, I think, at the personal level, but what there are consistent themes on it is the notion of wellness. And then, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm picking at these issues is for us, as I mentioned, for us to advance the science, we need to have to come to terms with some definitions that we can tackle. And that is the notion of wellness. I, I love the concept of allowing oneself to give you the chance of being better. That, that notion of um, empowerment, that you are not just the slave of, of that drug itself. I mean, I think that these are incredibly meaningful um, perspectives on recovery and the issue is how do we put them in a way that we can operationalize them that so that they can be studied, studied in, in again and in, in research sometimes we have to simplify a model understanding that this is a simplification but it's sort of in order to be able to advance certain specific questions and in my brain, it was going, like I said, I actually not having been addicted myself, uh, but having family members that, that have been, and, and as a clinician working with people, trying to garner what is it that happens in your brain when you no longer have that tremendous drive and a negative emotional state that leads you to just want to escape, that sense, I, I, I describe a sense of well-being, and that you can enjoy your your surroundings what does that how does that look in in the brain is there a way to parameter parametrize it to create a, a a biomarker for it i i realize that this is extremely difficult and complex but we're here to put our brains together to come up with suggestions uh, that can help advance the field so and that's why also one of the things that I was very curious about, I mean, so what can predict someone's success in recovery? And I think that obviously a big component is what is the support systems that you have in your surroundings. So that may not just be necessarily an internal state, it's the external 
networks that you have, but that external network is going to be affecting your brain in a positive way. It's going to create your reassurance. It's going to embolden embold you. So it is, um, I mean, I, I, I just see I'm struggling. I, I loved it. It was a fantastic session. And I, th again, thank you all for, for being so honest with us and for sharing your stories. So, so I'm, um, but I want, I, I wanted to distillate it and figure how could we work in, in a definition that can make it easier for us to do research. And you may come back and say, no, 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 this is untractable. But I refuse to believe that it is untractable. So, and that's why we are all in this together to come up with how to do it. Thanks, Nora, for those comments. I think, um, I think there's more work to be done here about defining other metrics of success that isn't solely focused on um, the absolute cessation of drug use. And so um, that's great. We're, we're all going to be employed and continue our work in this space. Um, I did have just one question to, for our panel one members in the last few minutes uh, from somebody who had brought this up earlier. And I think, Skip, you had answered part of this question, but I would love to open it up to the group. Um, the question is, for those of you have, who have been on your journey of change for relatively longer, what newer services or treatment options have come along that made you think that would have really helped at the earlier phases of your recovery journey? I'll just say three things real quick. The Phoenix Collegiate Recovery Programs, Recovery Community Centers. Those three things have changed the face of uh, recovery and we don't have enough of them. I'll, I'll, I'll second that by saying also, peer support. I'm going to be intentional. I spent 25 years going through the criminal justice system because of my addiction. If I'd have met a peer like me who was able to stand up and show mentoring, show support, show me how this looks on the other side, I wouldn't have spent 25 years going through the system. For me, what would be a game what would have been a game changer in my life is the access to harm reduction like the fact that harm reduction is now being more widely embraced is everything i have lost an inordinate number of friends and family members to hcv we didn't have access to sterile syringes we were bleaching out one raggedy syringe and it 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 killed people that I love. And so the minute you choose to walk into harm reduction, it being seen as a health policy changes everything because harm reduction isn't just syringe access. Harm reduction at its best is comprehensive care. It's saying, we're gonna support you here in your use and try to help you be as healthy as possible. But these are your options if you wanna go further along in that journey. And I think if, I would have had harm reduction services available if my friends and family would have had harm reduction services available. A lot of them would still be alive and I would have um, had better outcomes in my own life. I'm done. Uh, it, I, and I agree with uh, Keishi as far as uh, just that, 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 that culture of support that you get in the harm reduction agencies uh, that are driven by people with that experience where you're not gonna be judged uh, and for me, um, uh, peer-driven services, I went to a, a peer respite. Um, you know, there were so many times I would check into these rehab places where the person sitting across the table from me really didn't understand what I was going through, but they were telling me what I need to do. Um, and it, it, I it didn't make me want to go back to those, but, um, I, I did find a, a peer respite that was peer-driven, that was non-clinical, that, that the people there, uh, understood me and, um, I could relate with. Um, and if I needed a higher level of care, they could have connected me with it, but it was just really peer driven. And, uh, you know, just that culture of support goes a long way. Michael and then Kena. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I just want to mention uh, recovery coaching, uh, like it was when she appears helping peers, uh, peer support services was, is, is essential to me. Uh, with today's uh, issues and concerns that people have to address. And, and I also want to add recovery community centers. I managed a recovery community center for 11 years. And I tell you, 
that is really the the that that is really the the place that everything comes together for people. And when I say that, it's not only just a place of connection, but it's a place of uh, you know, hope is a place that really brings forth the, the the essence of what recovery is. When you start building recovery capital, you just become inspired by the people around you. And, you know, you just, it's a, it's a safe nurturing place that really shares the love of recovery. And you just get immense in knowing that you're in the right place because that, that recovery community center builds you to be um, the person you wanted to be. And I, I'm not saying there's other places that you can go, but a recovery community center is the highlight of what makes people really want to give back and become the person that they intended to be. And, and, and there's so much offered there that, um, you know, if there was recovery community centers and recovery coaches and peer services back in 93, when I came out of prison, uh, what a tremendous impact that would have made on the society that I believe today. Thank you. Um, with me, I would think that would help more. Would have helped back then was um, the telehealth and telemedicine, like because it made it where we're able to um, do it in our homes or and not have to actually go in because sometimes you don't have the time to get there or you don't have the availability for somebody else or resources resources to um or to get to different clinics so i mean with being able to do the um telehealth was really a big um it, it would help a lot when it came to me getting in recovery because like i said i was a single mom so I didn't have to spend my time at different clinics I was able to mail in my test I was able to have places that were closer to me instead of trying to figure out how I'm going to get there and get my daughter at the same time even when it came to um advertisement like I see uh more advertisement on about Suboxone now than I did way back then like I didn't know anything about the boxing about the, without being without somebody telling me about it. So I feel like if there was more um, advertisement and more people talking about the boxing and more people letting others know that hey, you can get help with it without having to go through that whole you know detoxing of yourself trying because that could be very harmful in itself you're trying to go cold turkey and when you've been on this one drug or many drugs for years you know so if you know that if i had that then i think i probably would have tried to get um clean sooner than later because like i said my cousin helped me to get into recovery she let me know and if I didn't know about that I probably still would have been trying to figure out what am I going to do what program am I going to get in or I probably would have been back in jail because it felt like I was going right back down that same hole even though I thought I could control it I was like okay I can do one pill this week one or two then it started to progress you know so I was going right back down that same cycle yeah, thanks, Shana. All right, uh, I forgot one thing, overdose prevention centers. So overdose prevention centers, recovery community centers, collegiate recovery, recovery high schools, and the Phoenix, uh, since we have people on the call that uh, can make a difference in this area. Um, so th those five uh, things, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Shelly. Well, I just wanted to um, express immense gratitude for all of our panel one members. I know, you know that your service here, you have jobs and other lives and a very busy schedule. So we just are so grateful of your time that you've spent with us. And I think this past 90, 100 minutes have really demonstrated your expertise in this space and something that researchers should really focus and listen on and harness all of your collective wisdom. So I really thank you for your time and thank you to um, our co-facilitators, Jess Holsey and Noel Vest for, for kicking us off and navigating all of these questions with us. So um, John, I will turn it back to you now. 
Great. Thanks, Shelly. Um, so we are going to take a, a, a break now until, uh, oh my gosh, where'd it go? Uh, I had one job, uh, until 12.15, uh, 2.15, so 10 minutes, um, and then we'll be back and we'll start the, the next session. So um, that will start at, at 2.15 for the, the second session on applied clinical practice. But thank you everyone for, for everything for this one. That was a fantastic start to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Carrie, did you say you're going to do introductions? I will, yes. I will sort of kick off the introductions, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, no problem. Jess, that was great. Well, that's phenomenal. I don't see if Noel is still on, but that was really great. Oh yeah, Noel's there. Yeah, Jess and Noel, way to go. Let's folks get back. If you could just turn on your camera so we know you're back, that would be helpful. You can, we'll let you turn them off again if you want. So we have a sense of who's here. John, are you going to say anything or do you just want me to start when I have a critical? Uh, no, I think I, I'll probably talk enough over the course of the two days. So <laughs> whenever you want. Okay. Um, well, it's one minute past when our fearless leader told us to come back. So here we are. We may as well go ahead and get started. Um, uh, first, the thank you so much to the first panel. They were phenomenal. That was great. Um, gives us a lot to think about and to build off of. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to say much. I just wanted to um, uh, have our panelists introduce themselves. I'm just going to start off. Um, I'll just, if everyone could just give a, a one minute introduction, just starting with your name, your affiliation, and then your connection to the topic. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, I am Carrie Mulford. I am the Deputy Branch Chief of the Services Research Branch at NIDA, and I've been at NIDA for just over five years. Um, I cover our addiction services research related to criminal uh, legal system involved individuals and homeless populations, as well as individuals with substance use uh, disorders who have experiences with exposure to violence. I also happen to be the project officer on some of the recovery research network work projects, which has taught me just a ton um, about recovery and how it's distinct from this concept of treatment. So that's just been really um, eye opening for me. I'm going to turn at first to um, Mark Fishman to introduce himself. He is one of our uh, co-facilitators today. Afternoon, everyone. Mark Fishman in Baltimore. I'm at uh, Maryland Treatment Centers and at Hopkins, and I am a clinician, um, a researcher, and a program uh, administrator. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I've been studying recently um, in relationship to today's topic is the, a role, an intervention for um, peer uh, specialists working to sustain people in uh, MOUD. Thank you. And our other co-facilitator is Aaron Hogue. Such a pleasure to be here with everyone this afternoon. Uh, I'm at Partnership to End Addiction in New York City. I'm a clinical researcher uh, for the past 25 years or so, myself and my colleagues have been involved in uh, understanding treatment processes from a relationship-oriented approach. I also direct with uh, Carrie Mulford's expert guidance, uh, one of the recovery research networks funded by NIDA. Ours is the Family Involvement in Recovery Support and Treatment Research Network. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Angela? 
Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Hegeman. I'm um, a research assistant professor in the ETSU College of Public Health. That's East Tennessee State University and co-director of our Addiction Science Center. Um, I am also a person, uh, the oldest child of a, a parent who struggled with alcohol use disorder. She doesn't necessarily define herself as a person in recovery. I even asked her this weekend um, if it was okay to talk about this in this panel, and she said absolutely. Um, so I do have that that portion of lived experience. I'm engaged on a number of the um, COARS projects. I serve as program director for the studies to advance recovery supports, have been involved with the Jeep initiative also, and recently funded by the um, Recovery Research Institute's project um, to study the workforce at recovery community centers. So I'm very interested in the impact of peer recovery support specialists and particularly their impact on the recovery ecosystem or sort of the community at large and how they cross pollinate um, mm -hmm. and, and add protective factors across communities. So I have um, some research goals in that area. I'm just super happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ashley. Ashley Shado, I'm a senior research scientist at Chestnut Health Systems Lighthouse Institute. I'm uh, part of a couple of the R24 mechanisms that Carrie just mentioned on recovery science. And I'm a treatment services researcher, um, primarily focused on youth and emerging adults who have substance use and legal system involvement. Uh, and we all know these, uh, these things, issues travel together. So combinations are all too common and especially for young adults. And so it's also why I've never approached treatment as traditional individual methods, but really instead took a socio-ecological approach to conceptualizing uh, conceptualizing any issue and the way to do treatment. Um, and so it's I've never focused on treatments and services that weren't um, sort of different in that they took a socio-ecological frame. And that frame was what really drew me more recently in my work to recovery support services research, because um, these services, is, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but they inherently take a socio-ecological perspective of a person's substance use, and they really focus on the promotive factors towards recovery success. So it's it's got that strength-focused approach to things that's always been a hallmark of socio-ecological interventions. And so really bringing together those things, I think, are, are key for youth and emerging adult success um, for recovery. And uh, and then in addition, that in the last five years, my, um, I've always had a passion for mentoring the next generation of substance use researchers, but in the last five years or so that has turned to emphasize bringing people with lived experience to be the future leaders of research. Um, and so that really has brought um, that focus and emphasis on recovery um, much more to my day-to-day -day existence um, with the people I work with as both researchers, staff, um, uh, many people on my team. So sort of pieces coming together at this point in my career. Thank you, Ashley um, and Brenda. Hi, Brenda Jones Harden. I have two university affiliations. One, um, University of Maryland, where I'm one of the PIs on the Healthy Brain and Child Development Institute, and the other at Columbia School of Social Work. But my real interest in this topic comes from my um, long work as a clinician and a researcher, working with young children and their families who come from high-risk backgrounds with a goal to keeping kids um, with their families. So awesome. thank you so much. Uh, Corey. Hi, Corey Vilsant. I am a community psychologist who serves as the Associate Director of Recovery Health Equity at the Recovery Research Institute and instructor at Harvard Medical School. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John. Yeah, hi everybody, John Kelly. I'm in Boston at Mass General Hospital in Harvard Medical School. I'm the director of the Recovery Research Institute here, and I am a clinical researcher. I've done a lot of work in uh, treatment development, treatment mechanisms, and also recovery support services evaluation. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. And Robert? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Ashford. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. I'm one of the principal investigators on another of the Recovery Research Network grants from NIDA uh, called the Peer Recovery Innovation Network, along with Dr. Jennifer Potter. Uh, first and foremost, in addition to my interest here, I'm a person with lived and living experience. I identify as a person in recovery, which has changed uh, many times over the last 12 years. 
Uh, I started as a peer recovery coach in Texas nearly 15 years ago and have gone on to become a macro social worker and, and now uh, a doctorate in uh, health policy that really guides the work that I do. I consider myself a recovery scientist. I have very little interest in studying the pathology of how people get sick um, and, or even stay sick and much more about the mechanisms, interventions of how they thrive and exist in recovery from everything from harm reduction to community-based recovery support services, uh, many of which have been described earlier today, which was a phenomenal conversation, um, but excited to hear about our work uh, as it concerns recovery support services. Excellent. And uh, the last um, member of this panel is uh, Michael who from SAMHSA, who you all met in the first panel. So um, Michael, just welcome back and feel free to chime in when, when uh, you want to. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn this over to, my, uh, to Mark and Aaron, who are gonna lead this conversation about what recovery looks like in practice, um, whether that practice involves behavioral treatment, pharmacological treatment, peer recovery services, community recovery services or something else. So um, with, uh, and just keeping in line with the goals of this workshop, I uh, look forward to hearing the panelists' views about how we can best think about the impact of social and environmental factors on recovery, uh, particularly in underserved populations where that's relevant. So Mark and Aaron, take it away. Well, I'll just start for one second and by echoing what I've heard a bunch of people saying uh, about the last session, just wow. Uh, and what a rich conversation. So uh, to Noel and Jess and others, you know, thanks for, for leading that. And there's so much to digest, not that we'll be able to pull all that off. Um, we're gonna try now to shift to the perspective of how do clinicians uh, see this? Uh, what's the role of clinicians? How do we parse that? How do we start to turn it into markers and measures and clinical goals? You, you put yourself on mute. Mark, here we are on mute. Huh, keeps muting me. I'll try again. But we're, we're going to shift to the perspective of clinicians thinking about what's the role here of clinicians uh, in the material uh, we've been hearing about recovery. Uh, how do clinicians parse, measure, uh, collaborate uh, with recoveries in terms of uh, setting those goals and promoting accomplishment of those goals? Uh, I will tell you that in the earlier conversation, you know, some of the material that, that resonated with me is we heard a, a lot of perspectives on how, yes, it's about substance use uh, to some extent, and that that's an important theme. And whether that's reduction in use or shifting from chaotic to less chaotic use or remission from problems or abstinence, but in that spectrum. But we also heard loud and clear that it's not just about substance use and that um, so many important goals of recovery have to do with the much broader view of human flush flourishing and uh, how goals and accomplishments in pursuit of happiness uh, m so much farther beyond uh, just substance abuse, substance use is, is so important. So I think we've got we've to wrestle with those things. And as Nora asked us to think about definitions, I, I think one thing to frame us as we begin is how do we interweave the different definitions or goals of thinking about remission from the clinical disorder interwoven with recovery in a broader sense along a spectrum of improvement? And is it important to distinguish those things? Are they congruent? Do they always aligned, do they not? So th those are just some observations. And then we, we have some questions that we'll ask the panelists, but Aaron, uh, let me ask you to add some introductory comments. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just only say the following, you know, most of us would agree that, that good clinical care of any kind takes into account not only the treatment of what the immediate health risk or health insult is, but thinking about what sort of the long-term perspective for return to functioning might be. If you are in a ski accident or you 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 hurt your knee and you go and, and the best kind of treatment is gonna not think just about the structure of the knee and the repair of the knee, but uh, what's it gonna be like to return to healthy functioning? What are the supports that are available to you? What kind of PT, et cetera? 
Uh, as a member of the clinician community, I want to say on behalf of uh, those folks, of which I am a member, I don't think we've done a very good job historically at thinking more long term about what happens beyond just treating the immediate insult, but thinking about what the longer term prospects for wellness, how that wellness can be supported in the natural ecology and what that looks like. And, and I think in today's earlier panel, uh, we heard a lot about that, uh, about the, the, the relevance and the importance of recovery being self-defined and uh, feeling sometimes when you go to the treatment system, uh, pigeonholed, uh, inadvertently stigmatized, um, uh, put into categories that don't fit. So this panel is also an opportunity to have a dialogue about that, about the intersections between the treatment professionals the recovery support specialists who sometimes are professionals, sometimes volunteers, um, but more specifically how in the clinical world, recovery planning and recovery processes can be and should be directly interwoven into what treatment plans are so that a treatment plan is also a recovery plan. And how do we get from the space where we are to the space where we wanna go? And doing that in the context of Nora's challenge, which she has, articulated twice in two different ways. And that's a challenge of operationalization or definitions and trying to come up with markers that we can then investigate in a concrete way. So uh, with that, I just I uh, would love to hear opening thoughts from the panelists. And uh, uh, any panelists, uh, put your hand up and let's get with the opening thoughts. And then we do have discussion sections that we can get to, but. Uh, for starters, would anybody like to speak to some of these issues? It's a shy group. No, a polite group, not shy, which I totally get. Brenda, I think your hand was up first. Thank you, very much. Brenda. I got it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you, yeah. Okay, great. So I um, just want to make sure that as we have this discussion about recovery, that we think about the large numbers of women, persons who use substances, who have children to worry about, and how we define recovery from the perspective of parenting. One of the things that we always think about when we do this work is that substance use is not tantamount to bad parenting. And we want to think about ways that we can measure, for example, mental health flourishing that has to do with their interactions with their children, how they're able to think about their children, how they're able to call when they need help for their children, how they're able to seek their social support, their social capital when they uh, have children. So I just wanna put that right out there because this is something that I think about all the time, how we can provide um, a web of supports so that these children don't end up in the foster care system. I'm sure you all know the data, about 39% of kids who are in foster care have parents who are substance users. We have millions of children coming into the child welfare system because of alcohol and substance use. So I just want to make sure that that's part of the discussion. Very good. Brenda, I love that you're, you're reminding us that when we talk about recovery capital networks, right, it's not just network supports, but also network responsibilities. People are responsible to their romantic partners. They're responsible to their families and to their children also. Uh, Ashley, I think you were next. Um, yeah, and I uh, appreciate what Brenda is saying and uh, am, am speaking up now because I also wanted to highlight a, a particular sort of passion area for me is, is um, you know, when we talk about it, identifying as a person in recovery versus sort of measuring the phenomena, another group that um, I, I think deserves sort of a special spotlight is emerging adults. And I, I want that to, I want there to, to I want to keep a, a strong spotlight on emerging adults in all of these discussions because you know, on the one hand, they, um, and particularly emerging adults that have legal system involvement, they have the highest rates of substance use and problems associated with substance use, yet uh, our services are just rarely prioritized. The things that are important to the values and the things that are important to them, um, and, and, and 
They rarely care about stopping their drug use. Um, and so if we're gonna have systems, we've gotta have them uh, for emerging adults to, to be successful in reaching recovery. Um, they, they, the, the services need to, to, um, to think about that, uh, those, those values and it's evidenced by that the highest dropout rates are also among emerging adults when we're talking about any age group. Um, and so again, sort of it, it speaks to that. And um, before I pass it along, I just, I do wanna pause and say, just thank you to NIDA for all the efforts you're putting behind this work. Um, and also um, in particular, because I know everyone's not able to do this. Thank you to those of you who are using your privilege to live your recovery out loud. I want you to know it's, it's truly making a difference. I talk to trainees all the time. Um, and it's the undergrad students, early career, mid-career folks, um, and the investigators who are individuals in recovery. And I, I believe with having them at the table, we will get to solutions faster, just as evidenced by the discussion earlier today. I think those discussions are going to get us to solutions faster, uh, faster but um, having them feel welcome in this field and that they're not alone in this field goes a long way and um, and is making them actually want to come and be researchers and stick with the field. So I just wanted to say thank you genuinely um, uh, on that front. Thank you, Ashley. You're also, of course, a role model in that very area. John, you're up next. I just wanted to add, though, oh, thank sorry. you so much for the plug for, for young adults, emerging adults, because you know lots of people across the lifespan are using, but when did they start and the opportunity to uh, focus on earlier intervention when we think we can have a very potent impact on the trajectory, so important. That's right, and if we're being fair, we, we, we haven't historically spent enough attention in the early adulthood period, so we just know very much less about that than we do about mature adulthood, uh, and the time is now. Uh, John, you're up. Yeah, right on, um, Aaron, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, why do we wait, you know, until people have stage four addiction before we do anything uh, when we should be, you know, addressing these problems much earlier in, in adolescence and emerging adulthood and design and implement. And this is where I think of attraction and engagement of young people in some kind of activity service. Um, I heard Noel mention, you know, the Phoenix uh, multi-sport, you know, recovery community centers. APGs, uh, recovery high schools, collegiate recovery, all these things are very important services. I, I didn't mean to say all that, but that's just following on from what uh, was just talked about vis-a-vis -vis young people. Um, what I will say um, just in, in my opening remarks here um, is just say that I'm just so happy uh, of this focus on the social environment uh, and the social environmental context, uh, because I think that's exactly the right way to think about it. Um, the host is important. You know, if you, if, you, if you come back to the classic public health model of agent host environment, here we are again, focusing on agent host environment. We've spent a lot of time on the host, the person, um, on the agent, the drug, and less time on the environment, as, as our Aaron was saying. Um, but if you think about, we have to create the right conditions for remission and recovery. It's all about the right conditions. Uh, the right environments, because there's only so much we can do to the human organism at any given point in time. Healing does not occur in, a, in, in, the, in the 60 minute session or the outpatient treatment. It's in the rest of the time over time that healing occurs. You've got to have the right conditions uh, in place. So I'm so happy. I know we'll get into more specifics of what, what that means, but I'm just really happy of that very important focus of creating the right environments uh, that people can create and self-select into that will make recovery easier. John, thank you so much. Robert. So I have lots of, of thoughts, probably from where I was going to start, because uh, we've already got it kicked off and, and many people that I look up to in this, but I would echo uh, both for Mark and Aaron. Thank you all for, for hosting this and moderating and NIDA for doing it and, and echo that it's, it's about time that recovery is a focus at NIDA. And I AAA has done it for a little longer, but NIH writ large needs to do it more. As a person that's been in recovery and identified that way for over a decade, uh, felt kind of silent there for a while, right? And SAMHSA and HRSA kind of had the mix. So it's, it feels good. And I'm glad and, and excited to see it continue and that I get to play a part in that. And I think it's uh, because of that privilege and that I have relatively insulated to, to do so and wear my recovery on my sleeve, um, as was referenced too. 
uh, but also that we need to do more, right? And this is a good start and there's been lots of conversations and hopefully it's not the last, but you know, as somebody that also started my recovery at, in, at a, an emerging adult age, you know, pre-25, uh, there's a lot that needs to be focused there and on, on different populations, both BIPOC, pregnant and postpartum women, but all of it comes down to, from my perspective, as somebody that's seen these continuums of care and has the healthy tension, uh, perhaps sometimes unhealthy between clinical care, medical care and community-based care, there's a lot that we still need to do. Um, I think we really need to take heart of what we've heard earlier this morning, because my experience is the same. Uh, for every, you know, the 23 million estimated people that identify as, as have resolved a problem with alcohol and other drugs from, you know, John and others research at the RI, uh, not even inclusive of people in mental health recovery, we'd get probably 50 plus million different definitions. And we have to take that into account. Identifying any type of key indicators while necessary for research, certainly and operationalize it in that way, we've got to figure that out. But it's we're going to commit the biggest fallacy that we ever have if we try to put people into boxes. We're just going to create a better and shinier box. We need to find ways that we're creating the equivalent of precision medicine in substance use disorder and mental health and recovery support services where everybody truly doesn't only get to define their own identity, their own label, but actually what that recovery looks like for them. We can't just play platitudes to it and say that that's true. But whether it's remission or treatment goals, clinical goals, recovery support goals, we've got to find a way to operationalize true precision recovery support, true recovery related outcomes. Um, and that's going to be a monumental task. It's going to be an expensive task, but one that we have to accomplish because people consistently, whether they identify in recovery or have resolved another problem, if there's still people who use drugs, they deserve and are demanding autonomy. And until we have systems that can reflect that, even if the systems themselves like the evidence-based care and the gold standard of MOUD is great, but the people that implement it, the systems that are responsible for implementing it are not great. They're not unbiased. They're not unstigmatized. We have to contend with these things if we're truly going to make care. And I think if there was one, as we talk about outcomes and defining recovery, we have to figure out how we make that true, that we're not just playing platitudes to multiple pathways and programs to and of recovery or recovery-related outcomes. People need to be in charge of their own care and that needs to be in charge of their outcome. And that has got to be operationalized at the clinical and non-clinical level each and every single time, or we will have failed again. Robert, I really want to thank you for pointing out that this isn't just about operationalizing at the content level, but operationalizing at the process level and the context level, right? How do we operationalize the way that recovery goals are defined and the way that they are monitored? and how to do that in a precision medicine way. It's a it's a big task, but so worth the undertaking. Corey, you're up next. Oh, yes, thank you very much. And um, I appreciate hearing what everybody can uh, focus on today and what we'd like to bring to the table. And I'll go ahead and highlight something that's already been mentioned in the previous round. It's about racial, racial health equity as well. Um, we talk about this because we know that Black and Latinx people are half as likely to remit from substance use disorders. And there's a number of factors that are contributing to that. And there's ways that it needs to better play out in, in science as well. Um, you know, when I think about the recovery conversations that we've had now, um, I definitely would like to set aside the opportunity that, uh, that recovery is a social identity. Um, and that's something that could, should, cannot be taken from people. And also in rising to the challenge of trying to operationalize things for ultimately the sake of a research agenda. For example, for NIDA, um, I'll go ahead and jump in <laughs> with the way I really specifically think about things. Um, I think about recovery and um, in other words, I talk about having resolved a problem with substance use disorder. It's typically where people begin to either abstain or eliminate harmful use of substances. Uh, thereby increasing the likelihood of remission and the holistic improvements in the biopsychosocial functioning and the well-being. And when I think about ways that we really start to uh, introduce this stuff um, into clinical care, you know, uh, when we go see a doctor and they take our blood pressure and our weight and our temperature, we don't think anything about that, right? But we've kind of inherited a double standard in this field, thereby not really um, often enough applying measurement-based care to what we're doing and tracking individuals and how they're doing along the way. When I think of tracking, you know, I'm, th I'm talking about we need to be tracking their symptoms in terms of their meeting criteria, which would be a form of uh, remission. We need to be tracking their harmful or hazardous use because this is exposure to toxins that can 
cause substance related health conditions like the carcinogens that can increase risk of breast cancer for women. Uh, we need to be at, pay attention to post acute withdrawal symptoms. This actually was mentioned in the in the last session about how difficult this is. This lays a foundation for recovery. Furthermore, it's recognized as a contributor to recurrence of use due to increased sensitivity, due to lower ability to experience normal levels of, refor of reward, due to their downregulated dopamine systems. Um, and furthermore, tracking their assets and their resources that they bring to bear on initiating or sustaining recovery. Um, we think about this in terms of recovery capital. Uh, sometimes we are paying attention to their quality of life. These can be very important. You know, at the Recovery Research Institute, we've learned that some, some recovery vital signs, if you will, when it comes to self-esteem and happiness, they don't grow in a linear fashion after resolving a problem with alcohol or drugs. In fact, they dip for the first year. Okay, and this can be a very risky time for people because they are feeling this way. And so we need to be able to identify more than symptomology and pathology and other risks that they are facing during this time as well. And so I think that uh, I bring all of these things to the table when I think about what recovery is. You know, um, you know, initially I mentioned recovery capital. You know, we know that recovery capital can start at the beginning significantly lower for people who are using opioids or stimulants as a primary substance compared to cannabis or alcohol. This may reflect that they're part of maybe a more stigmatized or marginalized lifestyle, and they need more accesses to these resources up front. So this is a part of tracking these types of recovery vital signs, recovery capital, well-being, right? And you know, how long do you track it? Well, as long as they're in your care, that's how long you track it for, at least. So I'll throw that out there and I'll yield the floor. Correct. Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to ask, do, is it important that we make a distinction between remission and recovery, or is that just jargon that's not so important and mostly aligns? Do you want me to answer? Or maybe I'd let well, my- Yeah, I, I heard you use the terms and I'm just asking- Oh, yeah. No, I, I, think, I think it's good. No, I do think it's good that we make a distinction there. The field has historically been dominated by our definitions that do come from medicine, such as remission um, or abstinence. But we know that recovery is more than that alone. It's about the presence of health, the presence of well-being, and hence why we are now having this conversation about um, what is recovery to who and how do we operationalize it. Um, and and that um, this is uh, an endpoint that we haven't always considered before. In fact, we came from a treatment industry. We thought treatment was the goal, but what if recovery is the goal and treatment's one of the pathways? Mm -hmm. I think it's critical that we do start to separate these constructs. Thanks for asking, Mark. Yeah. If I had yeah, a magic wand, Corey, I just if I had a, and I'm gonna uh, let Angela go, but if I had a magic wand, Corey, I would have every clinician in the world have your vital signs on the table for them in five years, right? Every clinician tracking these vital signs that you're talking about when working with persons who are uh, using substances. Angela, uh, you're up next and thank you for uh, closing out our introductory remarks from the panelists. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be brief. I just, you know, so I kept looking for the, the emoji that had the, the mind blown. And I was really, you know, it's just, there's just so much to think about and unpack here, but it's um, a worthy cause. It's important. We have to have these conversations and an exciting, I'm excited that so many others are thinking in this way. And I just, it was music to my ears to hear the from the public health folks, um, because there is such John and, and Robert, just the ideas of, changing the community. There's so little that we can do, not so little, but there's uh, uh, factors at the individual level are sort of limited to the impact that the communities are having on them, right? And so when I'm thinking of operationalizing things, I'm thinking about Nora's challenge to us. And then I start thinking about what promotes and sustains positive behavior change? What empowers people, the people that we heard from in the first session, what is empowering folks to make positive behavior change? And what nor neural pathways, what parts of our central nervous system, what are the different ways that we can measure the kinds of things that make people wanna get well? Because we can talk about recovery, but we're really all talking about wellness and the desire for individual wellness. 
and teasing that apart from recovery and unpacking things and putting them into bucket, buckets will help us measure it. But truly, we can't separate any of those things. And I, I remember I used to say, I think I could stop working on substance use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery, and just work really hard at making healthy communities, really hard as a public health professional and making a community that does not st stigmatize people with illness, really hard at changing our political climate, really hard at changing our healthcare system, really hard at changing and, and sort of, I hate to say making the world a better place, but if our communities are healthier and our economy is healthy and we really get real with some of the barriers to health and wellness overall, then I think recovery will be more accessible for folks that are ready to change. And I, I, I feel like it's so hard to be articulate and it is so hard to drill down and sort of answer this question of how to measure and operationalize or predict recovery success without talking about these greater systems that are influencing it. And, and, and I come from Central Appalachia, I come from a, a tobacco farm in Western North Carolina and what will work for what would have worked for my mom and my family looks so different than what will work in Chicago, looks so different, right? And so we have to talk about geographic differences. And I'm gonna close just by saying, I have recently, I bought a book called Think Like an Ecosystem. And I don't know who started the whole conversation about recovery ecosystems or who coined the term, but if you know, I mean, I, I've talked with a lot of you before and I do keep these. And, um, and I think so much about pollinators and our ecosystems and how sort of what makes a healthy ecosystem is reciprocal benefit and symbiotic um, relationships between people and, and, when we put things in buckets, it kind of goes against that ecosystem. So I have no idea how to measure a healthy ecosystem, but I think it's really important in this conversation is sort of that work at the community level. So I don't know if any of that made sense, but I'm really it, digging all of this. It, it does make sense. And I think it's so valuable to add that broader um, ecosystem perspective. And, and John, you mentioned that too, in terms of the social influences. The, the one thing I would say about that is as important as it is, I want us to remember we can't wait for the world to be the perfect place to try to help a person suffering in front of us now. And so there's a tension there and we want both. So we have to force ourselves to unpack even it's, it's, though it's difficult. I love that challenge. Robert, I thought maybe you wanted to, to jump in it, earlier. It, it was just on the follow-up question. Um, and I know it went to Corey, but it, it's, I do think there it's equally as important. I would echo what, what Corey shared around the idea of, of separating out, even if they are interrelated, this idea of, of remission, which I'm not even sure is the right term. I mean, for those that know my work, we do a lot of linguistics and stigma and discrimination and, and how words take on particular connotations and affect. But recovery is a social identity. It is defined at the individual level, it, you know, it's a, it's a it's certainly hard to categorize as an outcome. And I think NIDA, uh, as opposed to other definitions, both uh, academic from, you know, like ours at the Recovery Science Research Collaborative or at SAMHSA or at NIAAA or at others, they, they haven't really taken on that challenge that perhaps recovery is not what we should be defining. Let's just acknowledge that it is a social construct, a social label that people hold or don't hold uh, that they should choose to, and perhaps define remission in a more, uh, collaborative and person-centered way as well, right? Because in defining remission, and while it is important, it's also problematic because it, it has such a connotation of pathology around what is not, you know, whether you subscribe to the disease model, which I know NIDA does, uh, others may be more broad, but it, it defines elements of that, if you use the DSM-5, that are problematic for those that still who use drugs, who may use drugs how, you know, clinically we may consider problematic, but are just fine for where that person is in that context. It might be the actual dosage of medication they need for something else they're going with. So we have to unpack that. But I do think that it is critically important that we separate those and, and perhaps finally for the first time acknowledge that recovery is not what we're trying to define. Let people do it. It's a label. Let's define the clinical outcome, the operationalized one perhaps, which could be remission or something else, uh, and let recovery belong to the people. I'd be curious, uh, you mentioned the linguistic work. Do you have some suggestions for other words? <laughs> So not on remission. It's one that we haven't studied yet. And as, as uh, you you asked the question, it was in the discussion tied uh, 
started looking at it, you know, is it time to do so, right? And, and linguistics work is hard because over time, they certainly do pick up new connotations, um, as people have certainly called that as a critique of that work. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? Because I yeah, think, as yeah. you heard in the first panel, we, we have this tension between those that engage in moderation, uh, whether they use problematic use, chaotic use, however they may define it, that don't want the recovery label. And we risk doing the same type of, of clinical pathologizing if we just go for the word remission would be my fear, right? And, but I think as with most things, why I don't have a recommendation today, the first step is we need to go talk to people. We need to go pop, talk to people who are still using drugs at various stages of what we would currently define as the recovery process yeah. um, and ask them, right? Because we do have a, we have a huge problem, which is based on decades of what treatment and our systems have done, which started with the asylums, have gone to the 12-step facilitation, all of which has worked for a lot of people, but it only works for those it works for. We don't want to put people at a disadvantage now, because I agree with what you just said, Mark, is people need help now. We should give every opportunity to help now, and, and it needs to start by talking with them, including on topics such as this. It's interesting. It raises another tension that there is an important focus to be had on binary outcomes um, uh, or categorical outcomes, remission versus non, but also that there are dimensional outcomes and that there are obviously improvements to be had and to be celebrated on a continuous spectrum that may or may not meet some categorical definition, whether we have it today or we don't. And so understanding what the knowledge base is about the correlations between dimensional reductions in problems. It may not even be so much reductions in use, it may be reductions in problems associated with use, but whatever it is, how do those correlate with the functional goals and the flourishing goals that we're also interested in? I think there's so much work to be done there. Just as a quick bookend to that, because I think you're on the right track, and that's where we have done work in this, this kind of broader conceptualization and what did include remission is that if we classify and categorize the pathology on that continuum, we are, we should now do the same thing for gender identity, sexual orientation, all of these other labels. Why do we not do the same thing for recovery? Why have we fallen into this trap largely of a binary? Why can't recovery be the same type of continuum of, of wellness that the, the pathology state is that we've defined it clinically? Um, and I think there's something to that to explore. Ashley, you had your hand up. Yeah, and it was around the sort of thought of the continuum, and I, it's circling back also to what what uh, Corey was pointing out is that um, it's I I think even in measuring though if we, we can't we've got to be careful about not thinking of it as a continuum because it's that that um, Deltron said this morning or earlier today recovery takes sacrifice, and Corey hit on this that you know it's it, early on it can't that journey can can look you can look way worse off in your wellness than later in recovery and so it's just being mindful that if we're going to um if we're going to think of of measuring we've got to think of well what does recovery look like in that early stage for some individuals and then later and later um and so just keeping that in mind is that you know when with with young adults drug adult uh, drug use is that's their safe space that's drugs are helping them everyone they know and they feel comfortable with are also using drugs. They're, um, the, it's drugs are how they're connecting with people and feel comfortable in their own skin. And you're taking that away, even even with reduction, or you're taking some of those people away, and and they have haven't built that new community, or maybe they have to burn bridges um, and 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 rebuild, you know, somewhere else, or maybe they're they're in jail now or prison now, and you know, so things may look worse initially, not for everyone but for some. And so I think when we're thinking about measuring it, we have to make sure that we keep in mind what that phase may look like, may not be, may not look like wellness, but it may be for that individual, it may be better than, than where they were, even though a lot of the measurement may look worse compared to a year or two years from now where it looks way better. So it's, it's just that uh, it's a conundrum. I don't know what to do about it, but I'm just pointing it out. Yeah. John, you're up next. John. Yeah, um, interesting conversation. I guess, you know, there is a lot of confusion. Uh, we tend to go around in circles on this issue of recovery definition, and I'm not sure if it gets us really anywhere. I think we have a pretty good idea of what recovery is. Um, the, I, I think, you know, it's just reminding me of that, of that quote by Steve Jobs, if you, if you define the problem well, you almost have the solution. Um, and 
you know, I'm reminded of, of Griffith Edwards' work on, on the addiction syndrome itself, you know, talking about a biaxial uh, phenomenon being, you know, you've got the disease that happens inside the person, inside the brain, and then the consequences of those changes in the brain, uh, the neurotoxic neuroadaptations that produce the in, uh, in, impairments in functioning and consequences. But you, so you have the disease, just like cancer, you have an internal disease, but then you have the, the consequences of that disease inside the human organism, which results in uh, disability, in, in functional impairment. And this is what we see in substance use disorder. We see a change in the brain central nervous system, which results over time in greater and greater functional impairment. If you flip that around and think about it, trying to keep it simple for recovery, you've got the same kind of thing, but the mirror opposite. Uh, when, you, when you remove the poison, you remove the, the drug out of the body, out of the human uh, organism, Mother Nature can start to do her work to repair the damage done. And that produces positive consequences, the positive consequences of early remission, um, better mental health, better improvements in, in optimism, in hope, in functioning. Um, and that uh, increases the chances of ongoing remission, but we can also uh, enhance the chances of ongoing remission by providing access to recovery capital, uh, pr providing access to the resources, the building materials, the scaffolding that people need can help sustain remission in, in, in this global construct of recovery uh, by reducing that stress, the stress of the demands of early, of early uh, remission. And, um, I think it's helpful to think about it in these, you know, biaxial way, in, in these two axes, um, that you've got the disease and then you've got the consequences of the disease, you've got remission and the consequences of remission, the positive consequences of remission. And if we can amplify those positive assets of recovery capital, we can increase the chances of ongoing remission. And those two things, the, the recovery capital and the right environment that makes it more likely somebody can sustain remission is recovery. And uh, I think that can be helpful to think about it because we, we tend to spin our wheels a lot around this issue. I don't know how many conversations I've been around this. We've got, you know, everybody's got a pet definition of what recovery is and should be, um, but it's not very actionable uh, beyond, beyond remission in terms of measurement. So that's my chief complaint at the moment. And then that raises, I suppose, a whole host of questions about how to incorporate uh, those additional goals for remediation and uh, promotion of flourishing into treatment goals, because those have not traditionally been part, I think, or haven't been enough part of the way clinicians think about their charge. W would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely, right? If you think about it, Mark, and this was said earlier, you know, uh, you know, we focused on the host, not the environment, right? We focused on the agent and the host, not so much the environmental context to which people are returning after treatment or during treatment. Uh, when we're taking, a, you know, a treatment perspective, not everybody uses treatment, of course, um, but um, we have focused mostly on on the host, the person, um, and not focused very much on where they're living. Uh, do they have any optimism or hope that they can get well, get better, improve the quality of their life? Do they have a job? Do they have any education? Do they have a criminal record? Uh, all of these things we know make a big difference to the chances of somebody um, actually sustaining remission and increasing the chances of recovery over time. Um, you've got to have that hope and optimism. You've got to instill that. Um, now, it's important from a clinical perspective, Mark, you're right on. You know, how do we, when people are, are pre-contemplative or contemplative, you can't just say, well, you know, you know uh, what's your goal? And they say, well, I just want to flourish. Um, no, they, they come in and say, you know, um, I'm not sure I need to be here. So what do you do? You have to be patient. You've got to sit with them, make it, make it a safe, attractive place for people to come and be able to talk about what they want to talk about and don't push them. Um, this, is, this is the whole notion of motivational enhancement therapy, of course, um, is to be patient, try and see the world through that person's eyes. Um, it's different, isn't it, when somebody comes in and says, you know what, tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'm desperate. I'm ready to go. What do I need to do? 
then we can start to give directions and, and advice about what seems to what we know seems to work. Um, but before people are ready to hear that, um, you know, pushing that just falls on deaf ears. So I think from a clinical perspective, which we're focusing on here, um, extending the framework of treatment, it's really extending the framework of treatment to include, and NIDA has done this. Um, if you look at their new model of, of, of what constitutes comprehensive drug treatment, Google it, you'll see it. Uh, it incorporates not just bio, biological stabilization, metabolic stabilization, but family support, legal system services, um, reco other recovery peer support services, all wrapped around that. That's what NIDA itself considers to be comprehensive drug treatment these days, not just focusing on the host, but the context, the host in context, hopefully over time. Um, and we've got clinical models now, recovery management checkups, um, things like this, treating, treating addiction from a clinical perspective, like we would other chronic illnesses like hypertension, diabetes, and I'm going on too long here, but, um, uh, but to, there, there are these emerging models of care which have shown to be effective and cost-effective. Uh, that's important for a stigmatized illness like substance use disorder, that we can, we can implement clinical services in a way akin to other chronic illness treatment and produce not just better outcomes, but uh, in a very cost-effective way as well. That's good news and highly saleable uh, to legislators when we're trying to advocate for appropriation for treatment and recovery support services. Ashley, you've got your hand up, but just one comment for an asterisk later in the conversation, John, that raises a question for discussion. One, how do we get clinicians to think about staging the priorities and the sequencing? You started to talk about different stages of, of, of readiness to engage. So how do we get clinicians to do a better job about staging and doing good matching, number one? And number two, how do we get clinicians to do a better job of alignment with picking um, the right kinds of treatment and recovery goals that are congruent with what patients are likely to be invested in when there is some indication of misalignment as there often is. But anyway, I, I don't wanna divert us. I just wanted to put an asterisk. Ashley, you got your hand up. I, th I think I wanna take us down that road right now, Mark, because um, when, when John was talking um, about you know, what, what the goal needs to be and does abstinence or remission or whatever, uh, what does a clinician do with it? And um, clinically, what, what we do, again, because emerging adults are generally not coming in, youth, teenagers are not coming in um, saying, I want to stop using drugs and get to wellness and get in recovery. Those are not words they ever use when they enter treatment on, on, on by and large. And so instead of focusing on substance use or reductions of it or whatever, we, uh, we've done, and it comes out of the motivational interviewing world, but we, we start with a values mapping exercise at the start of treatment where we identify what values are the most important to them. And then those values are what we what guide all of treatment. And we may indeed focus on substance use, but we focus on it as a means to get their values met, to get them to, to, to be able to live out the, and achieve those values. Because it's usually things like uh, things about jobs or having access to money or relationships or what they can do for the world. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost never about getting off drugs or achieving recovery or words like that. And so, um, but, but we know, like what John was saying, we know that, and we talk to parents about this too, if we can get them to be, you know, stably have a decent job that gives them some access to money and build up some helpful relationships and, and feel like they, um, they have a purpose in the world and that they, you know, these things that people talked about this morning, they, they have purpose, they have ways to fill their time with meaningful things, they, they can pursue happiness, they, they can um, feel belonging in their ecology. Um, if we if we can do those, then then that's the recovery capital that they're starting to build. And that's what's going to lead them to a healthy relationship with substances in their life, whatever that might look like. Um, and so but that's how treatment has to be different. Clinicians have to, to think differently. Um, it's, it's also luckily how recovery support services usually interact with clients. It's the approach that they take. And so that's where I think we can learn so much. From uh, from that field to help clinicians do a better job, um, That's because super interesting, yeah, super interesting because it, in some ways, turns on its head 
the sequencing that might be more typical or might be more traditional, lots of people would say, sure, I get these broader human flourishing goals, but the sequence is remit from substance use or substance problems, and then we will get to those things. And you're suggesting that's exactly no. <laughs> the backwards order. Start with broader, more function-focused human flourishing goals as a way of making congruent what will proceed organically with remission sub use or problems remission goals that will fall in line in order to achieve those things which are so motivating absolutely That's super interesting. absolutely yeah because I, and it, it it's um it's through necessity that this has come up for me in you know trying to trying to go after the you know this this chasm of emerging adults that no one has wanted to to focus on treatment for and how to get differences and it's you know you've got to compete with something that is so valuable to them that their their use and the lifestyle that that is bringing to them it's so valuable to them and how are you going to compete with that well then let's talk to them about their values and let's figure out how we can help them achieve those values that they hold most dear in ways that don't necessarily include problematic substance use and and that's the way you get the, the conversation going and th this isn't rocket science it's it's no, not no, I mean, I it, it, like i said this value stuff came out of the most motivational interviewing this way of approaching the problem of not not starting with the um the the clinical problem but starting with what's what's going on for the individual that can't you know all these sociological uh ecological uh treatments that have been around for decades two decades or more that's the approach that's how they approach folks it's just we haven't been able to get that out into the clinical world. At the same time, there's been this grassroots support service, recovery support services. It's been, it's been doing it all all along, yeah. um, and so we've we've I, th I think we're getting closer to to sort of bridging those gaps. Angela, I think you're next. Yeah, I'll I'll be brief. I I, I kind of want to not push back, but sort of go back to something that you said, Mark, essentially is like, we can't make the world a perfect place. We have work to do. And, and, and I, I agree. And I think that so much is happening. We're here today to talk about the challenges of studying this, measuring this, improving it, but the work on the ground is happening. There's a groundswell of recovery supports happening while we're figuring out how to catch up with measuring it. And I, I just think when we're talking about this, and I, I don't mean to pose more problems, but I just, I, I really struggle to, to talk about how to improve clinical work without also acknowledging the behavioral health care workforce shortages, right? Like we can find something that's perfect and the best way to, to talk to emerging adults, but without a workforce, without supporting a workforce and a pathway to teaching that workforce how to do that, then I, I still feel like there's that tension or that struggle. And we also talk about building recovery capital. And, and I think John said, we kind of know what folks need. Maybe we don't need terminology, but we do know what folks need to build their recovery capital. But depending on who you are and where you live, in this nation, you may or may not ever have access to what you need to build your recovery capital. So I still really struggle with the tension between talking about how to improve outcomes and measure outcomes and really making sure that access across different populations and communities is really available. Because mm -hmm. um, if, if, if you can't access it, then some of our conversations are, are, are a moot point for folks that can't receive these services. Yeah, great point. Brenda? You all won't be surprised that I'm bringing up the 21 million children who live with parents who are using substances based on what I started this with. And I, I guess I want to bring them up for a few reasons. One, going back to something Ashley said about motivation, my experience clinically when I work with women who have a history of substance uses, they will often say their motivation is their children. So in terms of the you know, using motivational interviewing and other strategies to get them engaged in the recovery process, I certainly think thinking about their children is a big issue. And I hearken back to some of the tensions that I've experienced with treatment facilities 
where they do say, you know, we don't want them worried about their children. We want them to worry about their sobriety, right? And we have this um, uh, statement that we often say is children can't wait. And as you all heard, my interest is in seeing children being able to stay with their families. I don't want them going into foster care. So I want us to really think carefully about how we can help them function better as parents, even as they're struggling um, through recovery. And one of the things that I think Angela talked about was this public health approach. I think certainly in my field, we're looking at that approach and thinking about how can we you know, provide services at all levels of the public health sphere promotion, you know, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. And I am hopeful that some of the work that's happening in child welfare, where we're trying to look at these parents and trying to think about it from a harm reduction standpoint, that you all will join us and try to think about how we can incorporate some of these recovery strategies in those efforts. And then the only other thing I wanted to say was this idea, Mark, that you raised about dimensional outcomes. I mean, for us, it is not, we've never sort of thought about abstinence as the goal. We've often thought about how can we help parents move across the continuum. And from my vantage point, an important issue would be thinking about what that looks like for them, what are the steps that they can take in the recovery process that allow them to be more present for their children. We don't, they don't have to be perfect parents at all. We have this saying we call good enough parents. That's what we want to push for. And so I think there's so much that could be learned from uh, a connection of these two systems. And I just want to promote yeah. that as much as I can. No, such great points. A couple of things that resonated that I just wanted to highlight. One, the last thing you said is the idea of perfection. And we certainly never want perfection to be the enemy of the good. And it's so typical in our field, right, that we say people have to be well in order to be in treatment. And we used to throw them out for ha having lapses and relapses. I hope we're beyond that. But but anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful point. And then the other thing you said uh, is such a great illustration of the potential for misalignment of goals uh, between people in treatment and uh, treatment providers, w when you said that, uh, you know, you sometimes get to the point where uh, a, a clinician will say to a parent, no, 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 don't worry about your children right now. I need you to focus on X, Y, Z. 